again, everybody, and happy holidays, and welcome back to another episode of 605, the super podcast. Unlike wrestling on TBS, we've never been preempted by the Atlanta Braves. Once again with me, as always, <laughs> you hear the laughter there. I'm the great Brian Lass, and with me, as always, my co-host, winner of the Sheedy Awards for co-host of the year. That is a real thing. Congratulations, David Bixenspan. Thank you for your congratulations, although I thought I'm the host on the show and you're the co-host. I think it varies week to week. Yeah, that, that's you true. Know. That's true. Whoever, whoever does the intro. When you found out you won the Sheedy Award, did you go, oh, sheet? Like the guy on The Wire? No. No? Nothing? No. Have you watched The Wire? I, I refuse to answer on the grounds that it may incriminate me. A greatest show in history of television. You should watch it. But anyway, we're back again for another action-packed week of 605. I'm feeling a lot better last week. David Bixon has suggested some medications that actually worked, and now I uh, feel like I'm back to life. So, Bix, how are you doing this week? Good, but that, that sounded shady. It wasn't cocaine. I just want to specify it wasn't cocaine. But I want to start uh, – I want to follow up on something from last week. Uh, last week, I, I think I mildly offended Bix, and uh, although we haven't talked I about did, it, I'm going to assume – I'm going to assume that you thought about what I said and maybe came around a little bit. It was my assumption. It was my belief, and I intend to maintain this belief, that Jimmy Hart is an awful lyricist. That Jimmy Hart's songs, even the ones that sound okay, the lyrics are always, almost always uh, banal and insipid. Except for and, Lance Russell's nose. Except for Lance Russell's nose, which was originally Barbara Streisand's nose. No, it was originally Lance Russell's nose. It became, it became Barbara Streisand's nose for mass uh, consumption. Was that, was that the order it went in? Yes. Okay, whose nose is actually bigger, you think, Lance Russell's or Barbara Streisand's? Um, it's a different type of big. Barbara Streisand has the, you know, our uh, sister, our member of the tribe. Um, she has, you know, the more traditional, like, Semitic nose, while Lance has more of a, um, I don't want to say banana nose. I guess I should. <laughs> well, back to Jimmy Hart. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you pointed Speaking out of that. people who call him. I'm glad you pointed out that Barbara Streisand's a fellow member of the tribe, so people don't think we're anti-Semitic. <laughs> um, so Jimmy Hart, I'm going to focus on two songs this week that I think uh, exemplify his songwriting talents. And by the way, I do I do agree on the lyrics. I I, I think he song because songwriting and lyric being a lyricist are not the same thing. Uh, there's a song he wrote called "We Hate School." Um, it's amusing for many many different reasons. One of which I think he was probably about 40 years old when he wrote it. And the lyrics, he was, in some, the, he was like 54 and 95 or 96, something like that. So it was 54 and 96. So let's take 15 years off that. OK, so he's about 40. It's about 40. He's about 40 and he's writing We Hate School. And by the way, you will see it in the video playlist because there's a video of him doing this with Coco Ware and the Iranian assassin on guitars. Yes. My teacher don't like my music. She don't like my clothes. I said, up, up your, your nose, nose with a rubber, with a rubber hose. hose. This came out years after Welcome Back, Cotter, by the way. I like to shove her where the sun don't go because we hate school, but we love rock and roll. We hate school. And then we comes the chorus. We hate school over and over again. I should point out I actually own the 45 of this. That's probably worth a pretty penny. Maybe an ugly one. I don't know. I didn't get I didn't spend much on it. Um, I don't know. I'd rather I'd rather have a. Uh, I'd rather have Lance Russell's nose. That's that would be the be pro, the prize of the various Jimmy Hart songs for me. But I like I like having one of them. But when we get home, we turn the radio on. DJ's playing my favorite song. My mother yells, "Get off the phone! Have you done your homework? Is the radio on?" That doesn't now, rhyme. It doesn't rhyme. But listen, something I had a revelation while listening to We Hate School. I listened to it about five times. Now wait. For, now first, were you li did you listen to the original or to the re-recording? I listened to the original, and we will certainly, in, in very short, in a few minutes, talk about the Terry Funk version, which which is a whole nother. Well, I was show. talking about the Jimmy Hart re-recording. I think I listened to the original. What, what? The, the Memphis the Memphis video is the original, the one with right. the one with G, with Coco Ware. What's the re-recording? Um, I, I believe the one on the Outrageous Conduct album, which, okay, which I, had a separate video. That I don't know if it ever aired anywhere. With him in a schoolroom? Okay. Well, I know I saw it on the um, opening the vault show, but I don't know if I ever saw it anywhere else. Okay. So you've seen um, it, but you, you know what I'm talking about. I don't think that ever I know aired on Memphis talking. TV, though. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I never saw it on Memphis TV, but I know I saw it somewhere. Well, I had a revelation while listening to this song. Mm -hmm. 
hate school over and over and over again. A lot of Jimmy Hart's songs are the same as his other songs in a sense that I listen to We Hate School and I swear to God, it's the exact same song as We're All American Boys by the Rougeos. And it's, maybe, and perhaps crank it up as well. Yeah, it's structured the same way. And like even the instruments are a little bit the same. And then I had another realization. Mm-hmm. I feel like every Jimmy Hart song is a rip off of Blue Suede Shoes. And I mean it like this. I'm going to mm-hmm. read the opening lyrics to All American Boys as if I was singing Blue Suede Shoes. Uh-huh. From Montreal to Memphis, Paris, Vuvance, to all the girls, the Rouge is on the way. Like Every song is that exact way. Every Jimmy Hart song is just four lines like Carl Perkins would deliver it. That's every single Jimmy Hart song. Think about it. <laughs> I think. <laughs> and um, Don't call us pretty boys. We're not a muscle head. We hate the long hair look. We like the preppy look instead. I mean, every song is Blue Suede Shoes. <laughs> it works anytime you apply Blue Suede Shoes to a Jimmy Hart song. It works. Um, Let's see. American Made? Uh, I don't have those lyrics in front of me right now. <laughs> I want to be a Hulkamaniac. Have fun with my family and friends. I want to be a Hulkamaniac. Something, something, something to the end. You're, you're right. Yeah. It's it's all it's just not quite switch. sung that way, but it works. But it's still the same. It's always the same. It's four lines. Bang, 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 bang. Don't step on my blue suede shoes. <laughs> so, well, that's what I got to say about that. It's, it sounds fun? like the various Moppets in the background are stepping on your blue suede shoes right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I uh, the family's all screaming and yelling back there. <laughs> These dynamic mics are somehow picking it up. I don't know what happened. It wasn't earlier. <laughs> it wasn't earlier, but now they're all acting up. Hey, quiet back there! We're recording over here. Have some <laughs> class and dignity. So, Bix, <laughs> tell us about Terry Funk's Japanese album. Uh, Terry Funk, great Texan. Yes. Um, this showed up online a few years ago. Um, I just assume we're leaving that in, by the way. <laughs> you can leave it in. Okay. Um, I teach lessons. So this includes, uh, besides, so besides we had hate school, as we mentioned, it's got um, his version of Barbra Streisand's Nose, which is the high, undisputed highlight of the album. Would you agree? I, I would not agree. I think we hate school may be the highlight of the album. Or t- or actual great Texan, the the... The actual theme of the album maybe the best. Now, song. which is the ballad? The, the ballad is Rapongi, right? I think, yeah, Rapongi. Isn't that, of all the places to sing a ballad about. <laughs> 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 yeah. It, it's fascinating, too, because I, Jimmy Hart wrote, if not all of the songs, the majority of the songs, I don't remember because I don't actually have a copy of it, but. I do. The, I don't have a physical copy, but I think I have no, a digital copy. Yeah, I don't have a physical copy. I mean, I don't have like an actual yes. LP to hold up and read the uh, okay. the liner notes. But instrumentally, I mean, I guess it's just part of a Japanese thing, but it sounds like it, it was recorded like 10 years before it was recorded. Well, yeah, I don't think he was on the album. I think he just wrote it. I, Jimmy Hart. Right, right. I'm not even talking about – not even putting Jimmy Hart down for having anything to do with the production of it. I'm just saying whoever did produce it. It's fascinating because well, it came out in the mid-'80s. Or let's say what eighty four, and it it just it sounds so dated to an American ear by that point. But obviously, it fits in with what we know about Japanese music and what goes over well in Japan. Yeah, and now and there's also have you heard the Hulk Hogan EP? I think that's online. You know what? I Each I recently bond. did. I forgot all about that. I recently did hear that. That's another uh, <laughs> fantastic artifact. <laughs> Which I think Jimmy Hart was also involved with. I mean, I think he was involved with all of these, right? Although, I, I'm not sure with Hogan because I don't know. I don't know if they're buddies yet at that point. It's amazing how he became the go-to guy for everyone in music just because he was in the Gentries. You know, the Gentries. The Gentries. Well, what if uh, you know? What if one of the Count Five, you know, <laughs> had managed a band, had managed a wrestler at some point? It would have changed everything. <laughs> I don't even know who that is. You don't know the count five? I don't think so. I'm going to leave it out there. I'm going to let you do some homework. Okay. Yeah. The count five. But yes, uh, <laughs> no, my favorite song on Great Texan is Barbara Streisand's Nose, though, because he decides to kind of add these flourishes to it. Like like during uh, the instrumental break, he's like, I'm, I'm not going to do the Terry Funk voice, even though I probably, well, shouldn't. Um, 
<laughs> he's just like, have you ever seen Barbara Streisand's nose? In the Terry Funk voice. So I think, I think, I think that makes it the, the number one by default. Yeah, I mean, I could see your argument, although him singing We Hate School, you know, 40-year-old Terry Funk or whatever he was at that time, singing We Hate School, you know, with, with the, the enthusiasm of, of a Dory Funk promo, <laughs> that, that may be the winner for me. And I think he kind of buried it in his book, didn't he? I, I, you know, I don't remember. I seem to, uh, re- I seem to think that may have happened, but I don't remember exactly what he said. So then, like Jimmy, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grown man, and Jimmy Hart's kid got me singing about how I hate school. Yeah, he he said that to me back in like 1997. We were talking one time, and he was just pointing out how ridiculous the album was. That was when I first found out about the album. Was he told me, mm-hmm. and I was like, "What's on the album?" And he's like, "Oh, all these Jimmy Hart songs about." I hate school. <laughs> I said, I need to find this album. <laughs> I never did. I never did. The, the, the Hulk Hogan thing, I think, though, is a far greater abomination than Grey Texan is. Based on what? Um, I don't think it's really listenable in any way. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know. I think and also, maybe... it's hard to tell if Hulk Hogan's actually singing on it or speaking or anything. What do you mean? You think it's, a, it's someone – It doesn't Brad, really sound Brad like Brad Garrett him. doing the Hulk Hogan voice? No. It doesn't really sound like him though or it sounds like him weirdly processed. Like I remember that well, – what's the name of that blog that it was first posted on? I think it was the guy there that said he sounds like he's he, – he sounds like he's Muttley from Wacky Races. <laughs> uh, I wonder if he played bass. Um, I think he does allegedly play bass on at least one of the tracks. Interesting. Well, how do we jump further away from this topic, Dix? Um, I don't know. Did I? Where did I find a while back? I found an article. I think I tweeted it because it might have been on Google News or something. Archive, Google News Archives. That is. Um, that was like a review of Hulk Hogan's pre wrestling band. What did it say? Um, I think it was fairly positive. I, I'd have to I'd have to look, and especially now, now that Apple closed down Topsy too, it's going to be a little more difficult to find. I guess I went to see a band Saturday night, and it was four average-looking rockers and their giant friend. Oh, you found it? No, no, I'm I'm just making oh. it up. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you believed it though, so it must be pretty close to it. <laughs> that actually sounds fairly close to what I remember. <laughs> four typical rockers and their personal bouncer slash bass player. <laughs> The Tampa Pipeline, Hulk Hogan. Oh, God. Okay. Let's who see was that? that? David Schultz? Who said David that? Schultz accused him of being the Tampa Pipeline of cocaine and steroids into the wrestling industry. <laughs> oh, my. Well, that his, it was his actual nickname was the Tampa Pipeline. <laughs> hey, you know, as far as nicknames go, it's a pretty cool nickname, I got to say. Yeah. Didn't David Schultz also say that, like, was it David Schultz or, or was it Billy Jack Haynes or was it Superstar Graham? It was one of the three who said he said something like, you, you, you're you're smart not to try coke. You could get addicted before like just burying himself in a pile of it. Well, I heard that about a f- various people throughout the years. One of which I'm not going to name just because. You mean the one who's been accused of saying I can snort as much as I want and never get addicted? I don't know who that is, but I need to know a name for that. It it was in um I think it was it was in the 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 sex lies and headlock Vince. Oh, really? It <laughs> sounds like something Vince would say. Uh, no, someone who recently direct messaged you who was part of a uh, – a, 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 I shouldn't say it. <laughs> I shouldn't say it. Actually, you're I, right. I have heard that story about that person. Yeah, I, I heard it from someone who ran a strip club in Texas uh, when I was doing Yama Pit Fighting who knew <laughs> of him. And I thought we were never going to utter those words on this show. Uh, do, do you have a bleep button? Can you just bleep? It'll sound like I said something much worse than – Whatever it was that I just Then said. Yama pit fighting. Yama pit fighting. Anyway, let's move along, Bix. Uh, this week, some interesting audio was released uh, on Bo James' podcast. What's the name of his podcast again? Do you remember? Oh, it's um because he just brought it back with this. It's something like, like so hey, you want to be a wrestler. Yeah, it's something okay. like hey, bo- hey boy, you want to hey, be a wrestler. I, and I feel bad that we that I didn't have it in front of me. But yeah, I feel bad for you. We'll too, link but. it. We'll be linking it. We're going to be linking it because uh, based on listening to these two episodes, it's definitely something that people should listen to. And it seems uh, Bo has done a really great job of finding as much old Eastern Tennessee wrestling footage and wrestling audio and preserving it and getting it out there. 
I mean, he is probably the historian, at least for the um, Tri Cities area, for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if yeah. not, I would, I would say for East Tennessee overall, it would be him and David Williamson. David Williamson knows his stuff. I haven't talked to him in a long time, but I used to talk to him uh, a bunch. And good guy, really knew his stuff. Um, so I, I would say both of them are, are right up there. And actually, it's funny you bring it up because I believe David Williamson at least once had this audio that Bo James released this week. So what this audio was, was Mario Galento, a wrestler um, who wrestled all over, but primarily this this is concerning something that happened in uh, the Nicholas Roy Welch territory. In Memphis. In Memphis. Uh, at the television studio, on live television, actually. Um, Mario Galento, a little bit about Mario Galento. Mario Galento was, I believe his real name was Butch Boyette. I don't know if he's related to Mike Boyette. So but like, his real I name mean, was... they, they have a certain resemblance, though. Uh, I don't know about that. Maybe, I guess. I don't know. I don't see that. But he got his name. Uh... They're both shady looking, hairy guys. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're not selling me, man. Um, I was trying to. It, I was trying to make it. Le- uh, my point was that I was saying that it wasn't that close. Aside from that, <laughs> that Mike Boy looks like the, that Colossus of Death. You know, he really looks like him a lot. Um, he got the name. Wait, I thought Colossus uh, of Death was um, Duke Myers. I screwed Duke up. Myers, yes. Which, which one was Which one was Mike Boyette in Memphis? Apocalypse. Apocalypse. That's right. That's right. He was the hippie, Mike Boyette. He was Mike Boyer. He was Apocalypse. He had that losing streak on UWF. Right. And, he, and uh, who was – was it – was it Nick, Nick Lewis was the one who said that he's doing too much much of those marijuana pills, right? I don't know because I've heard that story about Nick telling it to the Freebirds. I've heard it – I've heard it placed – Oh, I think Michael Hayes has told it as Nick Goulas saying it to him about Mike Boyette. Oh, Okay. I, I uh, oh, the point is I've heard that story with various people substituted for Mike Boyette, so I'm not exactly sure who. Hey, look, if he thinks well, people it's smoke- it's a ter- it's a wrestling territory in the late '70s. It's pro- it probably yeah. probably happened to multiple people. If he thinks people were eating marijuana pills, he probably thinks he probably said it to a lot of people about a lot of different people through the years. Yes, um, except George. Uh, so Mario Galento got the name Galento from Spider Al Galento, and they were a brother team for a while. He had a wife named Smokey who later became a wrestler also. But when she was just a fan, she wasn't smartened up. And there are lots of stories about her pulling guns on wrestlers at shows. Awesome. Butcher Vashon, she pulled the gun on. <laughs> just various people. And eventually it had a there was a showdown where Fred Ward and Louis Tillet uh, insisted that he had to smarten her up because – they were having problems where guys wouldn't work with him because they were afraid she would shoot them because she she was pulling her gun at ringside on wrestlers. So how about that? And then she became a worker <laughs> even better. Oh, so, it's so, like, so it's like a, a more twisted version of the Wild Samoans getting broken into the business. Um, yeah, I would say a little more twisted. I mean, there was it was just having to fight a bunch of Samoans in the crowd, not just some, just some woman pulling a gun on you. <laughs> inside every show (laughs) so um and he was a notoriously wild character lots of stories about him starting fights there's a story about him at the ellis auditorium in memphis putting elvis presley in a sleeper hold i mean i've heard i've read that from various people frankie kane the, the great mephisto had said that uh various people have said that story to the point where Something happened with him and Elvis. <laughs> you know, you know the, the stories, uh, the two stories I remember reading, one was that he knocked Elvis out and then had a, sh- a showdown with the Memphis Mafia, Elvis's bodyguards. And the other story I read was that he put Elvis down and then Elvis woke up and laughed about it. That, you know, oh, wow, this, the sleeper hold really does work. You know, I thought it was just some wrestling thing. Well, so, and there are also a lot of stories about how Elvis wasn't that smart. So, Right. Wild guy. He had an earring and long hair in a time where most people did not have that. Most men did not have that. So wild guy. So this audio gets released and it's it's covering it's him going on the radio shortly after the events that transpired in Memphis and then also in Alabama, I guess. Right. This is before this is after the Alabama incident as well. Correct. Um, I'm trying to remember which was which, because then also there was the thing I sent you earlier that made it seem like he got brought back into Louvre after this, and then there was another incident. Well, here's what I know, and I recently rewatched the Memphis Heat 
bonus features. For anyone who wants to know more about this, Memphis Heat did a really good job. They did a bonus feature featuring all the different people other than Spider Galento, who was uh, already uh, – excuse me, Mario Galento, who was already dead by that time. But everyone else who was a part of it tells their side of it. Basically what it comes down to is this. Herb Welch um, – or maybe it was Roy Welch. Excuse me. I think it's Roy. Wanted He thought Jerry Jarrett was getting too big for his britches and he wanted to send a message to him and he offered Billy Wicks X amount of dollars to beat the shit out of Jerry Jarrett in the ring. And Billy Wicks is someone who absolutely could. Billy Wicks was a legitimate tough guy. I mean, oh, yeah, he, I mean was, he, was a, he was a good catch wrestler too. He was – I mean I know on the audio we're about to talk about Mario Galento refers to him as an Olympic wrestler. I don't think he ever got that far but I mean he was – a tough guy, and well, what was he? He became a sheriff, right? Uh, or was maybe I mean, but a he deputy? Was a, he was a sh- he was an absolutely a shooker, a ch- shooker, a shooker, a shooter. I say uh, you could, <laughs> uh, I, in wrestling terms, call him a hooker because he knew submission holds. Um, and he's, I think, he even still has a school that he runs. Like I think it's mostly you know his assistant coach that you know does most of the actual training. But he has like a catch wrestling school. I think in. I don't know if it's in Tennessee or what, but it, he in that area in the old. And he teaches territory. he teaches scatch and shooking at the uh, school there. <laughs> so Billy Wicks turned down the offer and said, "I don't want to do this. I don't want any part of this." Well, Roy Welch found someone who would, and that was Mario Galento. So live on Memphis TV, Jerry Jarrett against Jerry Lawler. Now, now oh. one thing because I I don't remember all this. But did. What did Welch want him to do it on live TV, or was that just Galento being an idiot? I don't know. That wasn't. I don't remember that being specified, so I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure. And by the way, I mean, look, it was foolish to do it. But if you listen to that audio of him, he doesn't sound like an idiot. I mean, he may have been, he may not have done the wisest things, but he doesn't sound like a complete idiot. Correct. You know, there are plenty of complete idiots in wrestling that you know <laughs> you get to do something stupid. Um, but he was someone who was considered also pretty tough. That's the other thing. Uh, and he walks in the middle of this match live on Memphis TV. He walks in the ring and he goes after Jerry Jarrett. And according to the story, as Jerry Jarrett tells it in the Memphis Heat uh, bonus feature, he immediately does the old the move. If you, you know, if you don't know how to – if you can't stop someone, you go right for their eye. And he popped his eye out. And Mario Galento popped his eye back in and they were going at it. And then Lawler, who was Jerry Jarrett's opponent on live television, jumps in and starts helping Jerry Jarrett get rid of Mario Galento. This is a whole big thing. Now, now also, is it, has Jerry Jarrett lo- lost the side in the one eye yet? That's a great question. I don't know. Because I believe with, with Galento, what they said was he already had a bad eye and Jerry Jarrett popped him in the good eye. Oh, Jarrett so, popped him in the – Galento right. in the – Okay. I forgot about Jerry Jar- Jarrett's eye, though. That's, uh, that's interesting. Um, so then a few weeks later, Jerry Lawler is wrestling somewhere in Alabama. And at that time, Jerry Lawler and Jim White were a regular tag team, uh, very successful in Memphis. And Jerry Lawler thought also it was – Also wrestled in Florida too. Also wrestled in Florida too. But in terms of drawing, they oh, yeah. were very successful in Memphis. And Jerry Lawler thought it was suspicious that all of a sudden he was in a singles match on a show. And all of a sudden in the middle of the match – into the ring with a straight razor comes Mario Galento. Because even though he was originally being paid to beat up <laughs> – he's being paid to beat up Jerry Jarrett. Now he wants revenge on Lawler for jumping in and interfering with what he was trying to do with Jerry Jarrett. And at this point, Roy Welch – oh, wait. So Roy Welch was involved if he was booked in a singles match, I would think, on purpose. Uh, yeah. I mean someone was involved. Well, now, why is Roy Welch upset? He doesn't know that this was an office hit. Lawler doesn't. Law- he, I don't know. Look. According to what people said, and and Jerry Jarrett and Billy Wicks both kind of indicated this, Roy Welch certainly was looking to put up money for someone to to hurt Jerry Jarrett. But why? But the I don't understand what I almost feel like. The I mean, Lawler, I know it's wrestling, but you would well, think that he wouldn't really blame Lawler. Unless, I don't know. Yeah, the Lawler thing sounds like the singles match may have been circumstance, and Mario Galento just decided to go for it. I don't know. I don't know if okay. the office sent him down there like, look, we'll get him isolated. Because what happens is Lawler runs away when he sees the straight razor. They get near the locker room, and he said that Galento was about to get him with that razor. And then uh, Jim White jumped in with his gun. And I, oh, <laughs> I of believe course he, Jim White had a gun. And I believe he hit Galento over the head with the gun and sent Galento scurrying away. Uh, shortly after this, and, and I believe probably after the audio uh, that we heard, uh, Jackie Fargo – calls up Galento and threatens to kill him. 
which causes Galento to get an order of protection <laughs> against Jackie Fargo, where Jackie Fargo can't come within mm. X amount of feet from him. And then there is a court case. I believe the, it was thrown out of court, right? He sued Jackie Fargo. Was that right? Right now, wasn't there also a thing where he got brought back to Memphis and Fargo tried to hit him with a nightstick or something? I'm not exactly. What was the thing that was in the Slam article we were looking at earlier? I'm not exactly sure what they were saying there. Okay. Because that was that definitely wasn't part of the Memphis Heat bonus feature. But that's the overall story. And somewhere in this time. He's blackballed. Mar- He's blackballed, and Mario Galento goes on Memphis radio and shoots. Basically, he exposes that the matches are predetermined. He exposes that Jerry Jarrett owns is part of the office. He expo- he, he he outs Terry Garvin on the show because he talks about the Garvin brothers. He goes, "They're not really brothers. One of them's tough, but the other one is funny in the ring and funny out of the ring." So I mean that's that's the first public outing of Terry Garvin, who, of course, it should always be pointed out when this is discussed. Even though everyone in wrestling knew, his family had no idea. Yeah. yeah that's, that's no, always... but he was married with kids. It was like a double life, even though like everyone knew. And if you watch, if you watch WWF television, you knew, especially house shows. Yeah. Well, so he goes on this radio show. And another thing he does, which is I find funny, is someone asks about blood. And he says, well, I don't want to say exactly how we do it because I don't want to uh, give free advertising to any uh, you know, blade company. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> what did you just I, say? I was trying to figure out what, what I felt like he was I, – I think he was just making a weird joke, but I also felt like he kind of had – because you know how the, the the way it was with people who didn't know wrestling, that if you told them about blading, they didn't believe it? Right, right. So I'm guessing that was kind of his way of saying that. I mean, I feel like that sort of makes sense. Yeah. Um, so- and he also he, he uses the word programs. That's right. He uses programs. He uses go over. Yeah. He uses a lot of inside terms. And the host of the show does not seem to be a professional wrestling fan at all. Quite the opposite. No. He only likes legitimate sports. And he seems to be fascinated by this whole thing, which is why he brings Mario Galento on. Now, the phone callers hearing Mario Galento expose all this to say that wrestling's fake. He doesn't say it in those words, but he's saying wrestling is fake. Right. And talking about all this that's going on leads right. to – some fascinating callers. What did you well, think of the And callers? also with the host, though, what's interesting is at first he doesn't seem to really get the appeal of wrestling as a show if it is a show. And it's – as Galento sort of talks more, he seems to better understand what it is. Well, he keeps asking why they can't just be like amateur wrestling, which he claims are drawing massive crowds in Iowa. <laughs> well, now it is. Well, now. 1974 it was. It wasn't, <laughs> right. I don't think. In 2020, wait, was, was, the, what was the record this year? Was that Iowa or was that somewhere else? I thought it was somewhere else, but maybe I'm Or right. was the first one Iowa and then the other one was somewhere else? Not exactly. Not a big amateur wrestling guy. But yeah. it was in the Observer. You know Even though it's in the Observer, I still, there's certain areas of the Observer I kind of gloss over, and that may be one of them. Okay. You, but you always, you're like me, you always jump right to here and there. No, I, I will read the headlines. No, I mean I read that. No, but I mean the, your fa- my favorite part of the regular news sections is always here and there. Oh, here and there is always great because that's where you get like the weird stories and the obituaries of the guys who can't make like the, the headline section. But that's, like, also oh, the, the- that's also where like the best stuff is that like no one other than Dave has heard. Like yeah. all of a sudden something like you get just some weird remote like indie story or whatever. Yeah. So anyway, yes. Yeah, so the callers – um. I think we both agree on who the best one was. Um, so oh, the first one. That? The, was first that the first one. one the she one? was the first caller, okay. I believe. Yeah. Is you want to exp- – should I explain this? I'll exp- okay. I'll take this one. <laughs> okay. Go for it. See, so there is a woman who calls. Does not sound particularly old or anything. I mean because I'm just thinking – I don't know. I don't even know why I pointed that out. Uh, and she's talking about she's not a wrestling fan. But she happened upon wrestling recently, and and that was when she learned that that it's a show. Uh, what, what what word did she use? Did she say show or show business? I think she did. Maybe she did. I, I don't remember. Galento was primarily using the word show and show business, right? Yeah, I don't see. I don't if he would outright saying. say anything, I think he did. I think it was show and show business. He was trying to differentiate between contest and yes. Performance. 
I don't know if he said performance though. So. Maybe not anyway. performance. It was contest was what he was trying to say because he was trying to say like I have a five thousand dollar five hundred dollar challenge. I'll fight anyone, and callers would say. But aren't you fake like the rest of them? He's like, no, no, there's a big difference in a and contest the host would say and that an too. exhibition. And the, ho- and the host would say that too. They, no one seemed to understand that he was saying, yes, I understand that I'm saying that this stuff is – but I'm also a tough guy who would – so I'm saying I would beat them in a real match. Yeah. It, it, was, the, it was the most awkward grandstand challenge ever and not, not for <laughs> any fault of his own. You know what I mean? It's like I don't think he did a bad job in laying it out. <laughs> so this woman and says, uh, "Yeah, so she doesn't really watch wrestling, but she put it on a couple of weeks ago, and then she found out it was a uh, I don't remember she said fake or show or whatever. She <laughs> puts it on, and, and it's some kind of beat down by various heels on a baby face, and she called the police because no one was stopping it." And she, because you know where I'm going with this, um, she go, she calls the police, and she's like, "I'm telling them they got to send someone down there to stop the murder." <laughs> and they laughed, and they at, laughed at, at, at her. They laughed at her. <laughs> I just can't get the word "stop the murder" out of my... somebody. Stop the murder. See, we neither one of us can successfully mimic her voice either. She was just like this. Well, this, we're not really. I'm not trying too hard. To no, but I'm just saying, like, she sounds like this little old lady, and she's like, I, I just called like and old... said, "Stop the murder!" <laughs> it's so great. And they it's... laugh at her, and she's frustrated because I don't think they explained why. <laughs> so she calls the TV station again, asking them to stop the murder. And they would not, and I don't remember if they actually explained it to her, but I think they just laughed at her again, and then she was like, oh. And that was that, was that with that with that, with that fine uh, lady. Can you imagine a nice, slow Saturday morning in the Memphis Police Department? And someone, oh, Jimmy, answer the phone. Answer the phone. Stop the murder! Stop the murder! It's the one, a murder! It, yeah, this is 1974. God knows how many people in the city are watching this in the first place. <laughs> You know what I mean? At least seven I mean, out of ten people with the t- with who are watching TV at that moment are watching this anyway. But even like in 1990 when Eddie Gilbert ran over Jerry Lawler, it was the same kind of thing where people started calling the police station saying there was a car accident. He ran him over on live television, and then they point- had to kill the and then they had to kill the angle. Um, right. Well, also, and then well, they were still doing high ratings then too. It was like a ten, like they were still doing like ten ratings, thirty shares. Um. But yeah, and the, you know they had to kill it because it was Lawler had to come out and kind of try to no sell it, even though he really was hurt. You know, you know if that had happened today, Mario Galento would be out there selling T-shirts that said "Stop the Murder" <laughs> on pro wrestling tees. Yes, the, he would as soon as as soon as this aired, it would go viral. There would be a hashtag. Yeah, and his pro wrestling tees store would immediately have "Stop the Murder." Stop the murder. We should have named our podcast Stop the Murder. <laughs> but she's a great caller. And then there are other great callers. There's one guy. Yeah, well, these two stand out above the rest. Yeah. The the guy who called up to say he witnessed the – how did he put it? Say, would you talk about – what it was like something like – I think I – think, or no, it was I, – I totally believe you. Because I think I saw one of your unadvertised matches the other night at that restaurant. Yeah, that's right. And and Galento just freely admits it. Oh yeah, you saw that. It was a guy. You know, we were looking for him. <laughs> it's just this he guy's- admits that he just ambushed someone. <laughs> I mean, it's really not clear if it was a professional, another professional wrestler or not. With his wife. With the with Galento's what was it with Galento's wife or the the wrestler's wife? I think he was saying he was with Galento's wife, and the other guy was with his wife. Isn't that what he said in the? Isn't that what he said on the air? I guess so. Yeah, Smokey, the the gun toting. What? <laughs> For some reason, all of a sudden, I start thinking of um, Ricky Morton and Andrea. Oh boy! And Tracy Smothers and uh, what was his girlfriend's name then? Uh, was it Rose? Was it still Rose at that time? Uh, I don't think. No, I should remember this. I don't think it was Rose. It was, uh, oh, God. I mean, obviously, and everyone knows Andrea, Ricky Morton's girlfriend, but I don't remember Tracy's girlfriend's name from then. 
Yeah, Rose may have been right before that. But anyway, yes. Yeah, so they did. It, it, it's out, for what Galindo said. It's out. It's out like he was just admitting to ambushing someone yeah. at a restaurant. He was at a restaurant and saw someone he'd been looking for, and he got him. I got him. <laughs> and by the way, like I said, and, and I would encourage anyone, uh, Scott Teal. Who puts out? Who, he, he's the publisher of Crowbar Press, who have done great wrestling books: the Ole Anderson book, the Stan Hansen book, the Assassin book, JJ Dillon. J, J. J. Dillon book, and many others. The Tony Atlas one is actually, quite frankly, a little underrated. But he used to do a newsletter called "Whatever Happened to?" And in "Whatever Happened to?" there was an issue that had an interview with Smokey, uh, Mario Galento's widow, and then Mario Galento's stories told by Sputnik Monroe, Dick Steinborn, Frankie Kane, the Great Mephisto, and various other people. And it just sounds like he was a fascinating guy. And the interesting thing was in that issue, it said uh, it cut the interview with the wife and it had a little like uh, break box. And it said, we're going to tell the story about what happened with him and Jerry Jarrett and Jerry Lawler in the next week's issue. Cause we're gonna, next next issue wasn't weekly. And we're going to interview everyone. And then that piece never came. Well, at least Memphis Heat did. Yeah. Years and years later. Because they really got everyone. And so thank- thankfully. Yeah, other than Galento, who was passed away by that time. They got everyone who was involved, pretty much. And, Mar- and Galento was already passed away by the time of whatever happened to you, so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right, so. But, so where were we with the callers? But that audio is good. You know, it made me dig up. Uh, I had a tape of Michael Hayes on Dallas Radio in 1984 on Eagle 97, K-E-G-L. Uh, and it's him. And it's a fascinating interview because he's just up there. He sounds a little coked up or, you know, coming down maybe. And one of the callers calls in. And, you know, he's getting various callers. Half the callers are like totally Von Eric, and the other half of the callers like the free birds. There's one caller who said, I really don't like Mike Von Eric, but the only good thing I can say about the Von Erics is at least one of them's dead. And Michael Hayes like stopped him. He's like, whoa, I don't want to say that. I, I wish David was still here. Beat me up. You know, like the callers are out of control. You know, there's various women calling up just like, you know, oh, you're a cheater. The Freebird, you know, the Von Eriks are going to beat your brains in. One caller calls and asks Michael Hayes, he says, I just want to know, uh, is Hulk Hogan and Kerry Von Erich on steroids? <laughs> and Michael Hayes goes, well, you know, I really don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, they were. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say Kerry Von Erich isn't because I don't know. <laughs> you know he, he just completely well, the stigma wasn't really there as much in 1994 to say the least well when it was brought up when the caller called up and said are they on steroids the host of the show jumped in he goes what do you think they're russian athletes <laughs> so that that's kind of where the mindset was well i mean because i think about you know like hercules hercules hernandez doing those promos in mid-south where he's kissing his biceps and going you know 200 of diana ball a day that i mean that's 1984 yeah, that's, a, that's the same year as this. One of the other interesting things in this Michael Hayes audio is he talks about how him and Jimmy Papa, who's with him in the studio, have been shopping the Bad Street single around. They just got back from Los Angeles, and they met with MCA Records and Scotty Brothers and Epic Records. And Epic Records is sending someone down to Texas this week to come see them and talk to them. And the guy they're sending down is the manager for Cindy Lauper, David Wolf. Hmm. <laughs> Which is fascinating, too, because this is right before Michael Hayes and the Freebirds go to the World Wrestling Federation. With David Wolf as their manager. With David Wolf as their manager. So it's very, very interesting that that's... Yeah, do you know when exactly in 84 this is from? Well, here, here's what I know. They're talking about the Freebirds not liking Skandar Snack Bar. And they're talking about Killer Khan coming in, but they're okay with him. So I'm guessing this is probably July of 84? Okay, so maybe, yeah, so, the, so they're June? right before they went yeah. up. Because they, right they, they, they started in August, so. Yeah. And then there's a caller who calls in, and the guy sounds wasted. And Michael's like, hey, where are you at? He's like, hey, I'm, I'm at the bar. Bam Bam's here with me. And Michael's like, oh, tell him he's supposed to be here. Said, you know, send, send Bam Bam down. He's like, oh, he's, 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 I don't know. He's kind of out of it. You know? And then they get rid of the caller. But the caller was at the bar with Terry Gordy. <laughs> it's really really funny stuff i gotta find a way to get this up on youtube yes or or perhaps on our feed or on our feed yeah we or both or whatever we'll we, we'll yeah. figure something out and you have a cornucopia of audio cassette goodies that we need to uh i do you know i know previous episodes we had talked about wayne st wayne 
the very uh, the raconteur and artist. That's a good word. <laughs> yeah, and, and celebrated artist, former wrestler Buddy uh, Frankenstein, Mike Hammer, Doctor Blood, and whatever else he called himself. And I found two audio tapes of me and Wayne talking and Wayne telling me stories. Some of the ones I had referenced previously about the condom and the condiment and various other things, stories of stampede wrestling. And uh, I got to find a way to get these uh, converted. And then I found a tape of 1964 Los Angeles wrestling audio. So interviews with, I think, you know, the Destroyer, maybe Freddie Blassie, various other people. And uh, yeah, I got a bunch of audio tapes. I really need to figure out a way to get these uh, converted and do something with them. But the uh, this Mario Galento thing is just must listen audio. I mean, it really is incredible. I mean, I really am grateful to uh, Bo for putting. Yeah, the it. name it's a two parter, and the name of the the uh, the podcast is "Do You Want to Be a Wrestler, Kid?" And it's available on BlogTalkRadio.com or wherever your finer uh, audio treats are stolen from. And we'll and we'll link it. And um... yeah, we'll definitely link it. And and you should all check it. out. It's a fascinating artifact. That you know, this is someone exposing the business out of frustration. Uh, when this wasn't a popular thing to be done, <laughs> I mean, people didn't do this, especially if they ever wanted to work again. And he also on his YouTube channel, he's been putting some interesting stuff up too. Oh, he put this audio the other day up of Ron Wright doing a promo on Luthez, and then Luthez doing the promo on Ron Wright. Yeah, I've listened. It's been wait till we put more because I thought I already heard some of that before. Like I. J- I never heard heard this before. I mean, so I no, know. on his YouTube channel, but I on his YouTube channel, yeah. Um, I'm trying, but he, I mean, he's put stuff like that up. He's put some Knoxville clips and stuff like that that weren't already on YouTube up. I mean, some Memphis stuff, some of his stuff from Southern States wrestling. Let me look because he said there was a match I asked him about a Southern States match that I really like, and I'm trying to see if he, you know, the world needs more Ron Wright interview footage. So uh, yes. <laughs> Um, okay, he didn't put up yet because the, there was a match he and his cousin Casey Thunder had with the Batten Twins in uh, Bo's promotion, Southern States Wrestling. Like, at least, it was at least ten years ago. I think it was more that I really loved. It was this loser leaves town cage match. Losers leave town cage match that was really really fun. And uh, I, he said he'll be putting that up soon. He's been put, he's starting to put a bunch of Southern States old Southern States up on the YouTube channel. Hey, hey, hey Bix, here's an interesting little fact for you. Mario Galento trained Tommy Gilbert and Norvell Austin. That's right. He said he trained Tommy Gilbert on the sh- on the uh, on the uh, what on the uh, radio show interview. That's right. And Norvell Austin also. He didn't say that on the show, but he trained him as well. Yeah. That's it. I'm just trying to think. So, because I mean, I, do we know? I'm trying. Do we know exactly like how old uh, Tommy's dad was and when he was working? Because I guess, well, because he wasn't really like a traditional working pro wrestler anyway, as far as training him. Like he was a carnival wrestler anyway. I guess. Because I guess I would have thought maybe he had trained him. I don't know. But I guess it makes sense that he wouldn't have. I mean, I don't know the age. I mean, that's a big point that you just Well, and Well, and Tommy started fairly late in life. Yeah. He was like, he was at least, he was like 30 when he started, right? I think so. I mean, he looked like he was 45 when he started. But the, but there are plenty of wrestlers who. Yeah. Um, Arn yeah, Anderson, Fujiwara. The Dory Funk Jr. story. That should be the name of his book. <laughs> Bachwinkle was like a little head of schedule, but then he looked that way for like 40 years. Yeah. Well, this Mario Galento stuff reminded me of something else that I was a little fuzzy on. So I went and dug it up and we're going to talk about this now. Right. And we have not I have, we, I have not done any prep on this at your instruction because you wanted. Right. Um, my my reaction to be on. The air. So I mentioned Scott Teal's Whatever Happened to newsletter. And I believe some back issues are still available if you go to Crowbar Press. And now a collection of them, as well as maybe some other interviews he's put together in a book, um, which the name of it slips me at the time. If I had it in front of me, I would plug it. Scott, send it to me. Um, so um, this reminded me, this Mario Galento story of, a, of another story, which I figured must have been around the same time. And it was in 1973. So that would have been around the same time concerning Dandy Jack Donovan. Now, I've never seen Dandy Jack Donovan. I knew of him because I believe he was one of the people Jim Cornette brought in to the Night of Legends in 1994 at the show I was at in Knoxville, Tennessee, which would have been my first exposure to his name and who he was. Right. Now, I always get him and someone else confused. Is he the manager with the top hat and stuff? He was, but I feel like there may have been a few other guys with that exact same thing. No, but I, there was someone I used to confuse him with that had a similar name. But if he's the, if he's the top hat manager guy, then I know who you're talking about. 
I'm going to read this right out of whatever happened to issue number 24 from August of 1996. Okay. This interview is available in his new book. I'm just going to read this verbatim. And from what I was able to gather in Jim Cornette's wonderful Tuesday Night at the Gardens book, it appears that the match he's talking about took place in Louisville, Kentucky, July 17th, 1973. Okay. So let me go to this. Okay. I do know, let's see, I'm going to start with, I do know that Christine and Jerry Jarrett hoodwinked Nick out of, you might say as well, say the territory. This was going on back when I worked in Knoxville a lot. I sometimes wonder if that little problem that we had wasn't caused by that. I was offered $7,500 to double cross John Kazana. I wouldn't go for it. Three weeks after that, we had that trouble with Tojo. Now, the trouble with Tojo is the match I had previously mentioned in Louisville. Scott Teal asks, what started the series? What, how did the series of incidents get started? Wait, did you mention the match, the Toto match on the air? Or did we talk uh, about that earlier? I just, I just said that in Louisville, the match just talking about took place in Louisville. Uh, it's this match with Tojo. That oh, 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 you mean the match you were talking about? Okay, that's in these. Got it. Okay. I thought well, you were saying you had told the story. Okay, I was a little confused. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I had turned babyface, and me and Bearcat Brown were going to, well, they showed the films that we made in Chattanooga several weeks before that. We come back and wrestled the Garvins, and we turned them away in Chattanooga for two weeks in a row. Then the tape was shown in Birmingham and Huntsville, and we turned them away both places four weeks in a row. The tape was going to be shown in Louisville the next week. Nick Lewis went on vacation. When he did, they did the booking for Louisville the following week. Well, they booked me against Tojo. Well, Nick wasn't there, and Christine couldn't be found. Ronnie West comes over and tells me to put Tojo over. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That tape is going to be here next Saturday, and the following week, Bearcat is going to come up here with me against the Garvins. Go back and tell Eddie Marlin or Christine that they need to change this. And Ronnie West said, well, I can't get to Christine right now. Well, it's time to get in the ring. Normally, before the matches even start, they come over and tell you what to do and let us work out our little spots. Well, they didn't tell us anything until just before the match. I thought Tojo and I would go out and go Broadway. You can't beat somebody and bring them back the next week with a different crew and make any money. When I turned babyface, Nick had already told me that I was going to get some heat, but he didn't tell me where it was going to come from. I hadn't really expected any problems because I always had a good working relationship with Jackie Fargo and we were pretty good friends. I didn't have, I didn't have nothing against Jarrett and didn't have any problems with Tojo. Anyhow, Ronnie West came back and said he couldn't find Christine. I said I was willing to do business, but let's don't chop the hand off that feeds us. If you take me out there and beat me with a one, two, three in about two minutes, which was all Tojo could go, take me out there and beat me like that. I'm not going to draw beans the next week. Go find Christine, change the match, or do something that's not good business as far as I'm concerned. So he never came back and the bell rang. Tojo went to the ring and the bell rang again. I peeked out the door and nobody was coming. I got to the center of the ring and Ronnie said again that he could never find Christine. He said, I'll tell, Joe, I'll tell Tojo to duck when you throw a punch, and you hit me, and then I'll disqualify you. This is Ron West refereeing? This is Ron West refereeing. I says, well, that's not going to help either. That's not going to help me a bit if I'm turning babyface. Louisville had a policy that two wrestlers couldn't fight on the floor, so that idea was out. Tojo didn't like the idea of me going over. He says, when the bell rings, you tag me and beat me down for a minute. I get up. And give you one chop and beat you. I said, don't do that. If I tag you before the bell rings, that's going to make me a coward to begin with. In two weeks, I'm going to be a baby face here. And see, wrestling fans don't forget that. Anyhow, I could tell by the way he worked that after one and a half to two minutes, he's blowed up. He now makes a wheezing sound to imitate Tojo. Ah, finish, finish. He's huffing and puffing. I backed him into the ropes and was slugging him. The referee kept coming in, and I keep shoving him away. Good old Ronnie West was pretty good at taking bumps for the boys. The third time he came in there, I picked him up and halfway beeled him across the ring and then went back on Tojo to get my heat back. Well, all of a sudden, he quit selling, and he slapped me right in the face with his hand and fingers real stiff. Just raked me down across the face. Well, shall I say, it didn't, take, it didn't taste too good or strike home too well. I just stopped and looked at him. Hey! Do you want to work or what? You know how he mumbles? Ah, woo, woo, woo. 
When I saw that he was about halfway shooting with me, I just went behind him and ran my finger about joint deep in his right eye. Oh. It popped right out onto his cheek. I took him down on the mat with an arm bar. I had my back to the babyface dressing room, and I could tell by the crowd that somebody was coming. (laughs) I didn't expect nobody to come in and attack me. Just get in there and break us up. You know. They'll, They'll get in there, break us up, and that'll be the end of that. Well, first thing I know, I thought somebody dropped a brick on top of my head or something. I let go of Tojo and spun around, and there's Fargo, Eddie Marlin, and someone else. Fargo had hit me on top of the head with a snub-nosed pistol. I knew then that there was some hostility there. I scooted out under the ropes and got outside. Wait, wait, wait. Jackie Fargo took his gun to the ring? Yes. He hit him over the head with a snub-nosed pistol. I told Eddie Marlin, stay out of this. This is a shoot. This is strictly between me, Tojo, and Fargo. I always felt I was friends with Eddie Marlin because we had a mutual friend who died of cancer in 1964. So Eddie backed away. Well, it climaxed the next day at the television studio. I went to the television station to make the interviews. We made all the interviews for the towns on Wednesday. Nick Lewis had been on vacation but got back in time to make the interviews for that week. He was late getting to the station, though. The McGuire twins, Billy and Benny... Uh, Billy and Benny were there. The Garvins. Len Rossi came in and picked me up, picked me out of the crowd and said, come here. I want to talk to you. I thought it was something pertaining to the night before, but he didn't mention it. He just said, Nick and Jarrett want to talk to you after the interviews are over. I said, yeah, I probably know what it's about. Anyhow, he says, I don't know what it's all about. He looked at his watch and said, I have to go do an interview for Johnson City. Well, he hadn't been gone for two minutes when the door opened and Tojo popped into the room. Right behind him was Jerry Jarrett. Right behind him was Jackie Fargo. I just sat there. Tojo had his hand in his pocket. When I realized I was going to have to defend myself, I stood up. Tojo swung at me with his left hand and I ducked under it. When I did, I went behind him and shoved him up against the wall. He had a gun in his hand, but it was stuck in his pocket. He had on those double knit pants and the hammer hung on the pocket. I just concentrated on the hand that he had the gun in. Oh, no. When he got it out, it fell on the floor and spun around. It was a snub-nosed thirty-eight. When I struggled with him, while I struggled with him, I heard Jackie Fargo go, Get that gun! It's mine! <laughs> when, I sh- when I shoved Tojo, I watched Fargo to see where he was go- what he was going to do with the gun when he picked it up. I didn't know whether he was going to shoot me or not. The next thing I know, Fargo and Jared are each holding one of my arms while Tojo hit me over the head with that wooden shoe of his. The next time we're together, I'll show you the scar on the end of my nose. He also busted my lip. One of the blocks across it hit me. One of the blocks across it hit me in the top of the head and split my head open. And it just took the end off my nose and split my lip clear up through my nostril. When he hit me on the head, I went to my knees and I could hear somebody say, close the door, close the door. Oh, boy. Luckily, they left the door open when they came in. If they had closed it, I honestly believe they might have killed me. I was probably five foot from the door. They already had me on my knees, but I just caught my foot on the edge of the shower and used it to launch myself at Tojo and knock him back onto the chair. I went on out the door and got outside where all the boys was. I turned around and waited for them to come out, but they didn't come out that way. They went out the other door. There were two doors. One came into the hall and the other out into the studio. Well, I was bleeding pretty bad. About that time, Eddie Marlin came back into the studio that all the boys were in. They would call you into the other studio when you made the interview. I said, get Nick out over here now. That's when I realized my lip was cut all the way up through my left nostril. I could hardly talk. Nick said, what the hell happened to you? I said, just ask any of the boys. They'll tell you. When you get the interviews over, I want to talk to you and Jerry Jarrett both. Nick asked, where is Jerry? Jerry was across the hall trying to get the blood off him. One of Nick's boys drove me to Baptist Hospital. This was like 10 o'clock in the morning. At 1.30, they got me sewed up and let me leave. Every time I tried to get into the office to talk to Nick, he had just left or was on a long-distance phone call, so I knew what the score was. I was booked in Jackson that night, so I called Nina and told her I wouldn't be wrestling, but I would be there. Tojo was booked on the card, too. Nina said, oh, Jack, you better not come over there and start no trouble. Trouble? Hell. Trouble has already been started. It started in Louisville. As it turned out, I didn't go because I had a brain concussion and didn't want to drive. 
I didn't hear anything for three days. Then Danny Dusick showed up and said Nick wanted to talk. I said, tell Nick if he wants to talk to me. He knows where I live. This is on Saturday. I had canceled my other shots and told John Kazana that I, couldn't be able, I wouldn't be able to make his town on Friday night. John always treated me extremely well and went out of his way to be nice to me. On Sunday, Nick came by to the house, and I, so I told him exactly what happened and who was involved. I told him that somebody was going to pay for what happened. He said it was just one of them things that got started in the ring. He got my side of the story. Nick said that Ron West told him I didn't want to do a job. I told Nick, well, you can say that if you want to, but I don't think it's good business to beat someone then bring them back on top the next week with a totally different partner. I said, I think you'll agree to that. He said, well, you weren't supposed to get beat. Ronnie West later told me they denied telling me that. That's the problem with getting the word to the dressing room with one of the boys. It always gets twisted around. In all, I was out of action for five weeks. I had a brain concussion and 85 stitches in my head and mouth. When I learned that the business was a work, my understanding was that the word comes from the office. Of course, by the time the word gets to the dressing room where the match is going to be held, it gets diluted and twisted around by the messenger. When Red McIntyre filled me in on things, he said to do what the office said, not what the boys said. I never worked in Tennessee again, except Chattanooga for Nick and Harry Thornton. How about that story? Wow. Yeah. It's weird that the first first thing on my mind was wait, Jack Donovan was going to be a babyface. They were turning. He had already turned babyface, according to him, in Chattanooga on Huntsville, and they were going to you know the, back then the tapes went around, and the angles went around, and even when it was live TV, they would just shoot the same angle in different you know. Right. It was in Memphis on Saturday. I think Louisville was also taped on Saturday, so they would tape it on Saturday in Memphis, and then the next week, part of that crew would tape it in you know in Louisville the next week. Um, I feel it, he should not have escalated it to hooking his eye. Well, yeah, <laughs> I think I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, he could he should have given Tojo some kind of receipt and maybe or at least taken him down and taken control of the situation. Now, but he should not have immediately hooked his eye. A few issues later in whatever happened to... Oh, boy. There was an open letter written by uh, Len and Joey Rossi. Because Jack Donovan's story somewhat implicates Len Rossi. Not directly, but just that he kind of pushed him where to be and then... Right. So, should I read that, too? Uh, How long is it? Should we save it for next week? (laughs) No. Well, what's the... How long is it? It's a a page. Okay. And how long was the previous? That was about two and a half pages. Do you want to just give the gist of it? Uh, the gist of it is that he had not that it's one of the I'm going to read this because there's some interesting things in here. Okay. Finish the story up. Um, let me skip a little bit here. We feel a response is necessary because the article appears to leave some doubt as the possibility of my father, Len Rossi, being involved in the attack on Jack Donovan. Since these issues were published, my father has spoken with Jack personally to assure him that he was not involved in any way. After 20 years, we now understand why Jack could have been persuaded to believe that my father was used to set him up for the attack. We also believe we know who that party is. The individuals who participated in the attack were Tojo Yamamoto, Jackie Fargo, and Jerry Jarrett. I was there at WNGE Channel 2 television station in Nashville, Tennessee, when the incident occurred. The following paragraphs will explain exactly what happened that day. I'm asking you to publish my letter in its entirety. Since many of the people who read your publication were former colleagues and fans of ours, our integrity and reputation has been compromised. They deserve to know the truth about what happened that day. As stated, the incident began in Nashville at the TV studio, but didn't really end until a few weeks later in Florence, Alabama. For me, it has never really ended. It is my sincere opinion that this incident is the worst representation of animalistic inhumanity I've ever witnessed in my 22 years as a professional wrestler. Wow. For over 20 years, what happened to Jack that day has been emblazoned in my heart, mind, and soul. It sickened me then and does so when I think of it today. It is a haunting, painful memory in what was otherwise, for the most part, a pleasurable career. I firmly believe with the core concepts of human decency that I was taught to value and respect that the individuals who planned, perpetrated, and participated in the attack on Mr. Donovan are no less guilty of crimes against humanity than those who planned, perpetrated, and participated in Hitler's death camps. Wow. It all started, as you know, out of a disagreement between Donovan and Tojo at a match in Louisville, Kentucky. 
Incidentally, in, my, in the ensuing years, I became a familiar acquaintance of Tojo. One night in my car, he confided it to me many instances in his life where he felt he had committed serious, wrongful acts. He told me he had become a Christian and that he was sorry for these things. This was a few years before Tojo committed suicide. He always seemed to me to be a troubled soul. I sincerely hope that he has now found peace with God. That particular day, I arrived late at Channel 2 for interviews. When I arrived, I saw Jack Donovan running down the hall, holding his head. I had never seen so much blood in my life, and Jack's skull looked like it had been cracked wide open. It was horrible. I remember yelling, what in the hell is going on here? Later, I learned from my father and other witnesses that Jack had been Pearl Harbored by Fargo, Yamamoto, and Jarrett inside the studio's narrow makeup room. I also learned from witnesses that my father, who was recovering from a car wreck that had almost claimed his life and was walking with a cane, was the only person who made an attempt to stop what happened. Jack Donovan had come to the TV studio to air his side of what happened in Louisville. He was seeking a fair hearing with the boss promoter, Nick Lewis. My father had been helping Nick run the promotion since his car wreck. Nick must have known there would be trouble because he told my father to instruct Donovan to leave and that he, Nick, and Jarrett wanted to see him later. My, fa- my father followed these orders, then returned to the camera room to help the interviews, help with interviews for the upcoming matches. That was his total, the total extent of my father's involvement. He did not set Jack Donovan up. Jack was attacked shortly after that. My father and I later spoke with Nick Lewis and vehemently expressed our disagreement to what had happened. We told Nick that this could have and should have, pre- this could have and should have been prevented from happening. I firmly believe then, and still believe it now, because Nick Lewis was the boss. He could have stopped this, and he did not. Two or three, three weeks later, my father and I were wrestling in Florence, Alabama at the Old Coliseum. Florence was a town that, was, that my father promoted in partnership with Nick Lewis. Jerry Jarrett was also wrestling in Florence that night. As my father and I stood in the parking lot, Jerry Jarrett approached us and told us that he wanted to talk to us. Even then, I did not trust Jarrett. How could I after what happened? But we said okay. Jared informed us that he knew we disagreed with him about what he termed the Jack Donovan deal. We told him exactly how much we disapproved of his actions. He, Jared, chose to deal with our response by telling us a story about some hunting dogs he once owned. Oh, no. He said the dogs had gone bad and wouldn't hunt anymore, so he shot and killed the dogs. Jared then said that his neighbors had noticed the dogs were gone and asked about them. He said he told them about the shooting the dogs, and his neighbors thought he was terrible. But that didn't seem to bother him. Jarrett told us to him, Jack Donovan had no more value than a worthless dog. I don't think that neither my father nor my stomach could have been turned more inside out than it was that night. We both turned away in utter anger, in utter anger and disgust. We left Jarrett standing there by himself. Mr. Jarrett can deny saying this if he wants to, but I was there and heard his words with my own ears. I would not hesitate to take a polygraph test concerning this matter. Shortly thereafter, in my ensuing years, my father and I slowly but surely were pushed out of the Tennessee Territory as far as wrestling is concerned. There are many other incidents in which people were used to discredit the Rossi name with the wrestling fans. Their attempts were not successful and our reputation is intact today. However, I won't go into great detail as that is not the subject at hand. In closing, the main point I want to make is to illustrate that the wrestlers of today, that the boys of both my father's and my generation failed in certain areas. In order to perform in a sport and a business that we all loved, we all allowed ourselves to be misused and divided by unscrupulous individuals. This is not to say there weren't any good promoters, because there were some. However, wrestling is still the only major sport that is not unionized. I am sincere in hoping that today's generation of grapplers will smarten up and unionize the sport in order to keep themselves from being parasitized. Para- I've never seen the word this way. Parasitized? Parasitized. Which I still don't know if that's a word, though. The way we were. I'm asking those who read this, especially Mr. Donovan, to please understand how painful it is to write this letter. This particular memory is one that a man really would like to forget. Unfortunately, that cannot occur. Mr. Donovan, as far as you are concerned, my experiences with you both inside and outside the ring are always pleasurable. I've always considered you to be a consummate professional and gentleman. My father and I both want you to know how sorry we are for what happened to you that day and that we had no part of it. Sincerely, Len and Joe Rossi. 
in the words of Nick Goulas, goddamn boy. Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, I that is one I did not know. It's a crazy story. Um, I mean, it's it's a crazy story on many different levels. Yeah. Um. Now, at any point, just check on it in college. He probably should not have hooked Tojo's eye. I'm not saying he asked uh, for what happened later, but... No, he doesn't say that. I mean, I guess what's interesting is, when did the Galento incident happen? What well, one was this? This was, what, what did I say before? June of 73. I think Galento would have been 73-ish too, right? Or 74? Yeah. So, I mean, both these incidents happened within a year, let's say. Huh. And again, one of them was Roy Welch setting up a hit on Jerry Jarrett and then Mario Glento probably going into business for himself with Lawler. And this one was confusion with the office and, you know, chaos afterwards. Now, was Jerry Jarrett office yet? Yeah. I mean, he was because he was promoting Louisville. That's right. That's right. He had already opened up Louisville. And I think he was probably booking um, some of the other towns, right? Yes. So, wow. Yeah. And again, his mom was office, so. Yeah. So it wasn't like it was just him. It was him. See, and, like, if that's true, um, that makes me believe some of the other more negative Jerry Jarrett stories. And by like negative, what? I don't just mean payoffs and stuff. Like, um, well, actually, wait, the thing from the Gary Hart's book about, like, making wrestlers' wives cook for them, was that more about the Welch's or Jarrett? I don't remember. Get the, the story I remember was Gary Hart beating up Jerry Jarrett in a bathroom. No, but, I mean, there was stuff. He was talking about how the wrestlers were treated in Tennessee and, like, making wrestlers mow his law, mow his, like, property or something. I'm not sure and stuff like that. I mean, I I pull it. Um, I pull it's been it up a while my, since I've read that. Well, you have you have the actual published book still. I I pull up yeah. the version on my computer, except it's not the published, fully published version. And as we know, it, at the very least, the Jerry Jarrett portions of that of the two different versions are fairly different. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's just it's a, it's interesting. Um, and as far as I know, Len Rossi had a pretty re- stand up reputation, though, didn't he? From what I gather, yeah. I mean, the the last time I've heard of him recently was, I guess, his health food store finally closed down, right? That's right. Um, yeah, wow. Um, but the idea that Jack Donovan does this interview by this. and the interview and he brings up and tells this whole story and, and you know, he, he tells the whole story without being questioned. I mean, he's just he, he has it in his head and he tells the whole thing. And then Len Rossi replies the next week to clear his name or Joey Rossi. It's, it's obvious Joey Rossi wrote the letter. And signed his father's name with it, but, you know, his father was along with it. Right. And he writes his letter to defend his father that his father had nothing to do with it, but then basically says every other part of it was true, that he, this guy was just attacked in a locker room. Yeah. By this trifecta of Jarrett, Fargo, and Tojo. Get the gun, it's mine. <laughs> the snub nose 38. I love the, the detail of that he says, it's not get the gun, it's get the gun. It's mine. <laughs> my favorite is – I'm going to reopen this thing just to read my favorite quote again. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he said to Tojo, hey, do you want to work or what? You know how he mumbles? Ah, ooh, ooh. By the way, it's pretty <laughs> clear that this is a somewhat sanitized version of what was actually said. Oh, Because yeah. a, 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 I believe Tojo's reputation was for using the word motherfucker frequently. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, as I alluded to with Nick Goulis, even though he's not, there's not as much from Nick Goulis, you know, everything you ever hear from him is, God damn, boy. Yeah, it's true. Um, it's interesting, too, now that when Jarrett finally breaks away from Goulis, the, the big disappointment was that Fargo and Tojo didn't go with him right away. Yeah, and now this, it, this makes that more interesting, too. Yeah. And, now, and right. you know, when, when, when Fargo had threatened Mario Galento... Mm-hmm. which caused Mario Glento to get a restraining order and go to court with him. It it was – the way Fargo explained it was he was upset about him going after Jerry Jarrett, but he said, don't go after Lawler. Lawler is my boy. Don't mess with my boy. <laughs> well, Lawler was sort of a son to him, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. 
It's yeah, I mean it's a different relationship, but that was that was wow. <laughs> Do you have any further thoughts on this? You know, it's um you know, I remember around this time I wrote a letter to Scott Teal just saying, like, please do just an entire book about stories about the Nicholas territory. Because I find every little bit of it fascinating. Every little bit of it. This is crazy. Um, you know, Jack Donovan was chased out of that territory due to all this. And even if you want to say him hooking Tojo's eye was unprofessional – even after Tojo, according to him, stiffed him and stopped working with him. The attack in the locker room takes it to a whole nother level. Oh, yeah. Oh, of, of course. Well, yeah, I don't know if there's too much more we can say about this. Yeah. Right now. I mean, this would, well, let's, let's, yeah, talk, we, let's talk about colonics. Let's move on to a lighthearted topic. That's, uh, I guess the best way to sum it up is that Dark Journey has been on a dark journey. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Bix this week sent me this link. Which I where did I find that Wrestling Classics I think? <laughs> Give someone credit for this. Yeah, I think it was Wrestling Classics. Dark Journey is a certified certified colon hydrotherapist. I'm going to read a little bit of her bio. Now, here. what do CHT and CMT stand for? Um, certified cert- hydrotherapist and certified massage therapist. I don't think that's actually a thing. I think it's licensed. Yeah, it is. Therapist. Oh, it says it right here. Certified massage therapist. So I, oh, I guess that's a state by state thing then. Yeah. I'll and, now, and where where is she? Because I see it's it's there's Hawaii. Is she in Hawaii or is that just the name of her colonic um, type of colonic? Or three one zero is California. Oh, okay, that's right. Oh, yeah, no, she's in Cal. That's right. Um, she's in Southern California. I remember because um. Who was it? Dan Farron or someone bumped into her at like Hollywood Book and Poster once or something. Really? What did she say anything? Um, it was years ago. I try to remember. I forget what the whole thing was. But this was this was when she had still vanished. This was before her sort of right. return recently. So, well, she's in California, South California, doing colonoscopy. So, Bob Barnett, if you're listening, <laughs> go go there and give us a review next week on the show. No, not colonoscopy. Go. <laughs> Not colonoscopy, excuse me. Well, let me read her bio here. Instead of her name, Linda, I'm going to substitute the name Dark Journey in here. Okay. Okay. A California native from Los Angeles, Dark Journey was influenced by her grandmother, whose approach to bowel management (laughs) included giving figs, prunes, castor oil, and dispensing enemas to all the grandchildren for nothing other than health, maintenance, and love. Okay, I have to interrupt for a second. (laughs) For a few reasons. Okay, first of all. You know how in Knoxville fans would chant castor oil at Ron Wright? <laughs> yeah. So was that like a reference to the um, <laughs> cleansing properties of castor oil? Was it something else about castor oil? I've never been able to figure that out. You know, I- I've never thought of it until this very moment. And you know who we can ask? Bo James. Bo James. He would know. That's not a joke. He would probably he would know. Committed to holistic health practices years later. I thought we were still going to talk about that first. <laughs> Dark Journey started doing her own enemas as a way to deepen the effects of various cleanses. No, no, wait, 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 wait. It, it occurred to me that in the first paragraph, I missed that it was both fibrous cleansing foods and dispensing enemas to the grandchildren. I missed the dispensing yeah. enemas a lot. Uh, First of all, her grandma, Dark Journey's grandmother, had a had bowel management. Hey, she had an approach to bowel management, and it included giving all the grandchildren enemas for health, maintenance, and love. Which, if I remember correctly, giving someone an enema regularly is the opposite of healthy. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean mentally. I mean literally. I think that's supposed to be bad for you. Mom, I don't want to go to grandma's house again. Why? She always gives me an enema. Just, just deal with it. I'm 14. <laughs> her her greatest enjoyment comes from working with clients to cleanse and detoxify their digestive tracts. She enjoys helping people design personal programs. No, wait, wait, wait. How far ahead did you go? I just jumped past, like, you know, who she's worked with. Okay. Advancing her, because I was just trying to see if there was anything. Her education in whole body cleanse. Okay, there's not much. There. I like the, the, the name of the place she trained, though, was the Myrtle Tree. <laughs> she's been doing this since 2003 and she's also been a massage therapist since 2001 um okay go on 
Dark Journey is continuing studies of quantum research analysis to attain practitioner level. This sounds like Scientology. She has completed the quantum health grade two and quantum reflex analysis level one. What's your quantum health level? I'm a, I'm a uh, level six. Level is that level when you learn about Xenu? That's when I learn about Xenu and the volcanoes. Uh, previously, Dark Journey dated Dick Slater, Tully Blanchard. That's not in here. Slept with Sting and maybe Bill Watts. What? That's not nice. That's not in here? No. Um, <laughs> I love that her name's Dark Journey. And, you know, like, let's say like someone she's working with finds out, hey, didn't you used to be in wrestling? Yeah, my, name's, my name was Dark Journey. Oh. That explains now, a lot. Now you're doing this. Maybe that's where she got the name was from her grandmother's enemas. Dark Journey. <laughs> Every time she went to grandma's, it was a dark journey. Many things took a dark journey. We're reaching new levels today, Bix. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> this really took it a complete 180 from Dandy Jack Donovan's assault. <laughs> Is it really? Is it real? <laughs> I want to know who was Google, who was Googling her real name. <laughs> yeah, really obsessively <laughs> to, f- to find out that now that she's a colon hydrotherapist. Also, is this website new, or was he like, I just I'm gonna Google her name. Well, her name. Do we have to? I don't think it's a totally kayfabe thing. Can we say her name? Yeah, give her a plug. Okay, plug so, her services. Okay, so it's Linda with a Y Newton and uh, C H T C M T. And is this just her website, or is she part of another practice? It looks like it's her site. It's it's a uh, intentional health co- intentional. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't even notice that part. Intentional <laughs> health colonics, not not mistake. There's no mistakes. There's no accidental health colonics. You go you go into. <laughs> you're fully aware that you're getting a colonic. <laughs> you better be. Oh wait, there's a Facebook. Yeah. Page. Should we see if, th- if there's anything to yeah, look at? Yeah, I on think this? we got to go there. I-, I wonder if any wrestling fans have gone in there. Intentional Health Hawaii Colonic Certification Retreat is what the Facebook. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a picture of a woman lighting a candle. I don't know where that candle is. Um, it is a, wait, we've got it. Oh, wow. You can do a, you can put a colonic retreat on in for October, 2016, the eighth to the 15th on your calendar. This is all, the sentence is also structured oddly. It's updated three days ago. Uh, oh, this is on the website, um, to get a certification. Um, trying to see, oh, this looks and he, like, and, he, and here's a picture of dark journey. <laughs> where? Uh, go to the pictures. Go to the photos. It's the uh, if there are nine on the page, it is the um, Bobby Brady spot. I don't remember which spot. He was the youngest of the Brady boys. He was but at the bottom, wasn't he? At the bottom. Wait, so if there's bottom not, left. Bottom left. Well, I mean, the there nine. there are four. There each row has four. At least the way I'm looking at it. So oh, okay. Wait, do I need to change the, adjust the size on the? No, I think you're not. Fine. You're not missing much. You're not missing much. Is she – okay, so wait. I'm looking at the – But she's here and Dick Slater's in an old age home. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Am I looking at timeline photos or am I – do I need to click something else? Just the photos on the left side of the page. Like when you scroll down a little bit, there's photos like – Oh, wait. Am I go- oh, wait. So I have to go back to the main thing. I think I'm missing. Oh, wait. You know what? Let me just go through these. Okay. Exciting. Exciting, isn't it, everyone? This home? looks like the place from the Man Men finale. What's it called? The Esalen Institute? <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, here's another picture of Journey. Would you like to get a colonic and be like, how would you like to take a walk down Bad Street with me? <laughs> well, I wonder I wonder if I wonder if she helped Tully cleanse his uh body of of toxins. <laughs> Wait, who's this Oh, great. That that was great audio just there. Um Unless you didn't hear that with the microphone bumping into something. Um, okay, I see her with someone holding. She's holding a stick of some kind that terrifies me. I was, oh, that's the candle. Okay. She. What the. F- <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Did you see this fo- the photo after the candle? She where she's with the other woman. And they're holding the candle. Um. Is that she, the one with the woman's ear? Is oh okay. Is that an ear? 
that's an ear. Whatever you thought that was, it's definitely an ear. Okay, okay. Now I'm looking at the next one. That's definitely an ear. Boy. Oh, that's like one of those ear. Okay, that that I've heard of that. I've heard. You've of heard that. of ear candles? Yes. I've never heard of ear candles. Um, it's like a earwax the uh, thing. It adds wax to your ears. No, I think it's a <laughs> earwax draining. Oh. Thing. Um. Linda with a completely dead-eyed look on her face with two of her friends at ho- at the Hawaiian sanctuary. You see this one, the very red tinted photo. Yep. Looking like her soul was stolen by spending a year with Dick Slater. Actually, I, sh- I shouldn't make light of that because that's probably not a good thing. <laughs> um, what is she wearing? There's her dog. What is- her dog has? What looks like um, some An kind, <laughs> some kind of fibrous jar of. Oh my god, on, on look, at the, look at the look on the dog's face. Look at the dog's eyes. Oh my god, what is going on here? I think we know what's going on here. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> this dog looks insane. <laughs> that, that is the look of a dog being anally violated right there. <laughs> I think you need to make this dog picture the picture for the show this week. <laughs> yes. Oh. Can you do this right now? Wait. Um. Options. Download. There we go. I- I'd like to uh, at this time take a second to thank Alan Blackstock for all the video playlists he's been doing for us. Yes. Keep up the good work, buddy. And uh, we should we see? It. Should we see if if there have been replies in the Wrestling Classics thread? I mean, I, you know that that place nah. is always the best, or. Nah, let's leave that for now. That could ruin this. this? Um, Kama, Kamahama the Great? King Kamahana? Kame, Kame, Kamehameha? Uh, wait. And, and wait, now, wait, now we're in the colonic room, it looks like. Um, I like how in the middle of this, this page of colonics and enemas, there's just like a waterfall picture, which may not be the right thing to have on this page. <laughs> oh, my God. Now there are people playing music, I guess singing about their colonics. Island National Food Market, where... um, Where's the missing link when you need them? <laughs> Can you imagine a nudist at a colon- get it, trying to get a colonic? I don't even know what that means. That was terrible. Was the missing link a nudist? You didn't know that? No, no I, I wasn't there that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, had, I wasn't, I I wasn't at that fan week. <laughs> I had the misfortune of reading his book. Wasn't that in Gary Hart? Wasn't that any version of Gary Hart's book? Uh, oh, it wasn't. Yeah, I don't think it was in the release version that that he that Missing Link accused him of discriminating against him because of his lifestyle. <laughs> um, now we've got how was, the mis- how was the Missing Link's book? Not good. Um, Greg Oliver's wife does the best she can with it. Um, but it's... Why, she's the writer? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know his wife wrote stuff, too. Yeah, no, and his wife's a good writer. She, she, when you hear later, like, I think Greg wrote something when Dewey Robertson died, where that, like, interviewed his wife about her experiences, and it was like, it was just, it, it's impressive that she was able to cobble something readable together. Um... We've got a young woman offering sprouts. Have you seen this yet? Yeah. With a plate of sprouts, a, a, a somewhat fetching young woman. I hate to admit it, I've gone through every one of these pictures. <laughs> uh, now I see hot lava cooling in seawater, which I guess is a um, a metaphor for the services you can get at <laughs> intentional colonics. <laughs> um. Why would you name we, it that? We should we should raise money to send Missy Hyatt there. Wouldn't that be an amazing interaction after all these years? I I, I don't even know. She With finally followed me on Twitter, and I don't know if that's a good way to start the uh, relationship. Oh, I'm sure she's going to love this episode. Hi, Missy. <laughs> Fellow member of the tribe. 
Yeah, technically. That's right. that's right. That Iyata show that you were classically on. Oh, God. The one where no. that caller called him and started yelling at her, and she said that the guy hated her because she's a Jew. <laughs> you know, that blew my mind when you I did, heard she that. She converted. She's the Rod Carew of wrestling. Although Rod Carew uh, didn't actually convert, so. <laughs> More waterfalls. Um, now she now here's something from, I guess, her actually being in Hawaii. Um. I think we got him. We see paper towels. She, she, she's smiling with someone as they're going through paper towels. Well, I guess you need a lot of them. And then it, it, she's pointing at a whiteboard where she scribbled intentional health Hawaii and Hawaii is underlined three times. It's the intentional word that I find so humorous. I just don't understand what. Yeah, I think I've looked through all of them now. Um, I, yeah, I just don't understand what the uh, distinction is there. I mean, do you? No. I um. Should I, I like it, intentional health colonics on Facebook? I dare you. <laughs> Only seventy-three people like it. Let's see if we can get it up higher. So, am I liking it? I, do I have to like it? Do it, Vix. But I don't like it. Do it. I don't like it. <laughs> you know. And, you and they don't have it on to follow. Oh, I have to like them to follow it. Okay, I'm doing it for. I can always. I, I did it. I, I, and now my soul is going to uh, be on a dark journey. Yeah. Your, your soul is now going on a dark journey. <laughs> oh, and I didn't. Okay, we should have looked at the different. We should have just the different albums. We've got certification slash curriculum book. Um, yummy organic foods. Is that really what you want to like? I don't know if I want to be thinking about that right now. Well, these are all the same. The these, these are all the same pictures. That no, I know it's all the same pictures. We looked them all in one fell swoop. I'm just trying to see yeah. if there's anything funny in the names of the uh, albums. Um, what pro wrestling personality would you most like to get a colonic from? Um, no comment. <laughs> you know, I, I do want to say, Len Rossi, I bet would be knowledgeable about the proper nutrition, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I do want to say something as we talk about Dark Journey, something, or, uh, something I thought about recently. You know, when you think about the 80s and valets in terms of who is the best looking, you know, many people say Missy Hyatt in the 80s. Many people would say Elizabeth. Uh, Dark Journey would certainly gain some votes. I think maybe the most underrated hot woman in wrestling was Precious. I mean, I'm trying to. I never hear anyone say like, oh, she was she was fine. But I, every time I see she's her, a like, very she is a very pretty woman. Yeah, she's fine. As Ric Flair would say, she's all the way live. <laughs> Wasn't that his expression for her? When did Ric Flair become a stereotypical black man? Like well, in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> like somewhere in mid-87, he became a stereotypical black man. <laughs> well, well, I mean, he she was the object of Flair's desire, though. Right, but that was what he kept saying, that she was all the way live. Like, all of a sudden, that became his expression for, like, three weeks. <laughs> Precious, it's all the way live. And, and I mean, she, she, was, she was so attractive that J.J. Dillon wanted to watch. Yeah, in the closet. You know, the Miss Macho Man thing that we talked about last week from ICW, where Randy Savage and Lanny Poffo kidnapped yes. Pez Watley and dressed him up in drag to be Miss Macho Man 81. Two things I want to say about that. One is, I was right the second time when I said that Lanny Poffo's line was, follow the bouncing ball. I love being a girl. Um, the second thing is... Lanny and I kind of kidnapped him. Kind of kidnapped him. The second thing is, Ronnie Garvin really has a thing with cross-dressing because he kidnaps Pez Watley. I'm talking about in character. If you go like based on the history of the Ronnie Garvin character, he kidnaps Pez Watley, dresses him like a woman. And then a few years later, he dresses himself like a woman as Miss Atlanta Lively. And then he dresses himself like a woman again to trick Ric Flair into thinking that he's precious so he can knock him out and throw JJ into a pool. Now, why didn't it, you would think, though, that – or I guess did they realize that you could not contractually have a wrestling match where you would win a night with – um a, a night of passion with a woman? Because I'm trying to figure – like didn't – you would think that Flair had a, an objection, but uh, we, but it's also awful and probably – and definitely not legal. 
So I don't really understand. How, yeah, never mind. That was. T- well, you know, when Crockett Promotions started running out of money, they weren't spending it on legal fees. So they didn't have a good attorney on hand to make sure the contract was on the up and up. <laughs> well, I mean, there was the whole. Well, no, they did have. They still had lawyers. There was a the little Beckley thing. <laughs> That's right. As seen in the Midnight Express 25th anniversary scrapbook. Yes. Um, My favorite line from that is where one of the fans said that Jim Cornette called him a black lung motherfucker. (laughs) 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 It's still my favorite line ever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think it's time for uh, Dennis of the Week, Bix. Dennis of the Week? Every week we tell a story about Dennis Carluzzo, the the late promoter from New Jersey, promoted WWA, promoted NWA New Jersey – was quite a character, and I could say from my, my standpoint, quite a friend and a great guy and a funny guy and someone who I want to make sure people remember. And there are so many classic Dennis stories, and in the weeks and months to come, we will have guests on the show just to tell Dennis Carlos those stories. And I'm going to jump in this week and tell a uh, Dennis story. And I started thinking about it the other day when we sent Alan Blackstock some footage for the video playlist – And it was after we had first talked about Dennis and I went on the internet and tried to see what Dennis clips there were. And there weren't that many, sadly, because there are so many good ones. His shoot interview years ago with Smart Mark Video was full of wild stuff. And there was a clip that I had seen on there. I don't think I'd ever seen it before. I'd heard about it where it was supposed to be Ian Rotten against Abdullah the Butcher. And Dennis gets in the ring and says, Ian's in the ring already, like licking the barbed wire bat. And Dennis gets in the ring. Ian was wont to do. Yeah. Dennis gets in the ring and announces that he just got a phone call from Abdullah's wife and that piece of shit isn't showing up and I'm going to sue his ass in Atlanta Monday morning. Here's the plane ticket. And he holds up like the plane ticket. (laughs) And it was like that was like such a Dennis thing. It was just exposing this crap in front of the fans. He offers refunds, offers free tickets. But the lines I love were, you know, that piece of shit. I'm going to sue his ass. (laughs) But that's not even the best Dennis story when it comes to exposing a wrestler for giving him problems coming to the show. Years later, actually, I shouldn't even say that. It may have been within like a two-year period of this. Well, yeah, Ian's working for him. Yeah. He had booked Ahmed Johnson on a show. Dennis had a cozy relationship at the time with World Wrestling Federation because Jim Cornette was his uh, best friend and Jim Cornette was working there. And at that time, Vince McMahon was allowing his performers – to work indie dates in the Northeast, or I guess wherever, but it was on on well, it was on their off days, and it was just it yeah. was just wherever. And I mean, I don't know if it was that anyone could book them, or it was mostly just people they because I th- it, I mean, if you think about it, like when you think, I mean, I'm sure there were others, but it's primarily like Dennis, Jim Kettner, Blaine DeSantis, people like that. Yeah, and maybe Tommy Fierro a little bit. I don't. I don't remember if Tommy was doing his own thing yet at that time. I'm not sure. ISPW was. I think. It, I think it existed like around '97. I never went to it, so I. I, I don't know for sure. All I remember uh, is when, like, he like. He sent email. He tried. He tried. He traded ISPW tapes to people to build like his tape collection. <laughs> and that's that's why all, like that's why like a ton of people back then had ISPW tapes that they traded because because Tommy just solicited them to people. <laughs> that's funny. Anyway, did, so. Ahmed Johnson's booked on a show. And this is 97, Dennis, 97, I guess. I would guess 97. Dennis sends one of his guys to go pick up Ahmed Johnson from the hotel. Now, I've been in this position before with Dennis. I had a Mercedes back then, and I would drive down to Dennis's shows. And sometimes Dennis, you know, like being in my car with me, so we would drive around together. And then sometimes at a show, if there wasn't anyone around, he would send me to pick up guys. It always worked out good. I would. Ha- I remember having a great conversation with Tommy Gilbert in my car for a while. The only time it didn't work out was one time he sent me to get George Animal Steel, who like had a hissy fit. He uh, he wouldn't. Dennis sends. He goes, look, we have a problem. The person who's supposed to pick up George Animal Steel wasn't uh, isn't here. Can you go get him? I said, yeah, no problem. Uh, I go over to the hotel room. I go to the hotel. I go to the hotel. I go to the hotel room. Knock on the door. I answered. I say, hey, you know, how you doing, Mr. Steele? I, I, I don't know what to call him. I mean, obviously, his real name isn't Steele. But I'm like, Mr. Steele, I'm here to take you to the show. And he's like, you were supposed to be here an hour ago. I said, actually, I, I wasn't supposed to be the one picking you up. I'm doing a favor. I didn't know. I don't know who was supposed to pick you up. I was just told this. He's like, no, no, no. You were supposed to be here an hour ago. I was like, I, again, I wasn't told. I was just asked about 15 minutes ago. Well, I'm not leaving. I'm not going to the show. 
I said, are you sure? I said, I'm not, I'm not going to the show. I said, are you 100% sure you don't want to go to the show? I can't do anything to convince you. I can't take you. Nope. So I went back to the show, explained it to Dennis, and I don't know what Dennis did or who he yelled at or what he said, but George Steele got to that show, <laughs> and his attitude got a little bit better somehow. Um, but on this night that I'm going to talk about, Ahmed Johnson's booked, and Ahmed, the guy goes to pick him up at the hotel, and Ahmed refuses to get in the car because it's not a car that he finds appropriate. I, th- I want to say it was a sedan, but Ahmed wanted a limo. I, I de- he definitely wanted a limo. I know that part of it. He wanted a limo. It was like a, it was like a sedan, which if you have a sedan, it's a good sized car. Even though Ahmed was a big guy. I, I bet it's also it's indie wrestling. I mean, it's indie wrestling in New Jersey. <laughs> With for a promotion that has New Jersey in the name, right? So he refuses to get in the sedan. Dennis, I believe, got on the phone, and tried to call him, called him up, and tried to convince him to come. He wouldn't budge. He wasn't going to budge unless he got a limo. So. What Dennis did that night at the show was he got in the ring and he explained the situation to the fans. Now, you got to put yourself in the fans' point of view. You're expecting this star in your eyes to be at the show. And all of a sudden, the promoter's in the ring telling you the guy refuses to be there. You know, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of people there probably thought, like, oh, the promoter's lying. The guy was never going to be here or whatever. I mean, you know, tricky things like that are commonplace on independent wrestling. Well, Dennis then goes a step further. Dennis goes, here's his phone number. And he gives the phone number to Ahmed Johnson's hotel room because Ahmed's book. He's going to be there overnight. He's not flying out until the next day. And apparently Ahmed Johnson went ape shit because his phone didn't stop ringing all night. It was just angry fans. And the thing about wrestling fans is you'll get some angry fans and you, then you start getting the smart ass fans mm-hmm. who just call you up and fuck with you. And that's what happened. And Ahmed Johnson went ape shit and that's my Dennis of the week. <laughs> Dennis's way of dealing with wrestlers who either no show or refuse to come to the show. Are there any audio tapes of people calling Ahmed Johnson? No. Dennis had audio tape. Dennis had great stuff. John Clark, who was the publisher and the uh, editor of the Wrestling of Flyer newsletter. And, one is, of the- and has been a uh, what the NBC affiliate sports anchor? Yes. For like forever now. The same channel, I believe, where Feinstein was busted. Yes. He, Which didn't, didn't some people use that in conspiracy theories? Probably. But John Clark was published for a brief time, probably the most underrated wrestling newsletter I could think of. Yes. Because the Wrestling Fire newsletter for a year and a half, two years, whatever it was, was very unique in that John got access to wrestlers and had better interviews with them than Wade Keller or anyone else. He got Eddie Gilbert right after the Super Clash 93 fallout, which is really an illuminating interview. He got Road Warrior Hawk after Road Warrior Hawk left the WWE. He got all these great interviews. He got Kerry Von Erich right before Kerry Von Erich killed himself. Uh, it, I mean, it was several months, but I, was, I think it was right after he left the WWE. Yeah. But while he was still I don't know about so that. I don't it know. Was was it? 92, it was 92. Was it 92? It was like... Okay. It was – well, because – I thought was it was involved. the end of 92. I think it was like uh, July or August because I okay. had that. Maybe, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm – I thought it was the end of 92. The point is the point is he got, he got the one in – he got the one ever sort of – I mean it's Kerry so he's not quite shoot, shooting but the one ever like insider interview with Kerry and it's with a nominally sober Kerry. It, yeah. It definitely makes you see Kerry in a different – you know, he's not that Kerry Von Airhead character that so many people try to portray him as. He definitely seems like he's someone really trying to take uh, his life into account and consider all sorts of things and things that have happened in the past and where he's going in the future. And there's a partial version or there used to be a partial version of it online that was from like another newsletter. Right. And well, John- um, and also if for anyone who ever wants to see it, some of his stuff, the 93 Flyer annual is in one of the miscellaneous folders um in jason uh jason campbell's uh google drive folder and that's the one on where he got history. sid right he got sid right after sid got fired yep he has sid i think it's sid dibiase and a round table of new yes. writer writers wrestlers including like who benoit like a bunch of guys yeah Meltzer, i think yes Meltzer, bruce hart yeah dave Meltzer was a big supporter of the wrestling fire he always plugged him uh, pretty well in there and John Clark was also a bit of a smart ass. Uh, I didn't really get to know him, but you know this. Is oh what wait, I, you're saying a smart wrestling fan from a, a smart wrestling fan from Philly was a bit of a smart ass? 
Yeah. There's this CD I have, which I got from Dennis and Mark Carlizzo called Old Lady. Oh, wait. If it's a CD, then you better get that. There's Old no Lady <laughs> started when John Clark tried to call Jim Cornette one day, and he dialed like one number wrong. And he just said, hi, is Jim there? And this woman went apeshit on him. You motherfucker, don't you ever call here again. So then John called there all the time and started recording the calls. <laughs> just every time the same thing. Hi, can I speak to Jim? And she would go nuts. And then one time he called up pretending to be the police, saying that they got complaints that someone's been phony phone calling her. And she thinks it's the police and she starts talking to them. And, and then he had the Iron Sheet call him up, call her up. And then he had Dennis, Dennis Carluzzo call her up. And it was just... <laughs> All sorts of crazy things. And this was like right around the same time where there were these crazy phony phone calls happening around that scene. I remember another big thing was to get the Iron Sheik on a call and then do a three-way where – Three-way calling. Yeah. So you would call the Iron Sheik and say like, hi, we have a collect phone call. We have a – not collect, but we have a phone call coming in from Japan. Can you please hold on? And he would say yes. And then they would connect him with Sabu and they would put them together. And, you know, one of them would say, I, I believe I heard that one. It was like, hello? Hello? You know, like, who's this? Fuck you. Who's this? Don't talk to me like that. You're calling me. You're calling me, motherfucker. Fuck you and fuck your mother. Don't you say anything about my, like, they just started going at it, like, right away. They started doing that. I think there was one with Virgil. There was one with Iron Sheik where they connected him with someone. It, I, I almost want to say it was a four-way call because they had Eric Sims on the phone. And Iron Cheeks started going crazy. And then they said that Eric Sims gave them Iron Cheeks' number and told them to do it. And then Eric Sims started defending himself and Iron Cheek was yelling at him. And so this is before the, the later uh, – before the eventual Eric Sims-Iron Cheek relationship then? No, no. They were already – that was like Eric Sims' like big thing because Eric Sims was really known as this photographer. And then I think it was uh, either September or October of 93 – Kevin Sullivan and woman like attacked him at the ECW show for selling like stuff of theirs without permission. That was the first time I heard of Eric Sims. And the first person I knew he represented or did anything with was the Iron Sheik. He was like the Iron Sheik's babysitter when he worked. I didn't know it went that far back. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 It was down back then in the nineties. And then there was another series of phone calls that did where they called people up as Andre, the giant claiming that Andre, the giant wasn't dead. That he was hiding from the Yakuza in Japan and he was like I – heard, I, I heard one where it was them calling the McMahon household and like, you know, hey, this is Andre Rusimov. You know, Who picked up the phone? I, you know, I can't remember. I think it was like a maid and it was like, I wa- ask Vince if I can live in his wine cellar. I'm hiding from the Yakuza. It was just all these ridiculous phony phone calls happening around that time. And I believe John Clark, uh, I could be wrong, but was at the center of most of them. Huh. Because he had he had everyone's phone number. So he would just call them up and start calling as Andre the Giant. <laughs> That's I, a noise I remember. <laughs> I just, uh, okay, wait, wait, wait. So, but yeah, back then, like, I guess it's not as much now when there's a podcast, but were wrestlers' phone numbers, like, how cave were they back then? In what sense? Well, obviously, with what, in whatever happened to the older, like, Tennessee wrestlers' phone numbers were already just, always just printed in there. But like, Oh, yeah, fo- phone numbers and addresses. I called, like, Killer Carl Cox when I was a teenager. But how protective were guys of their contact, of their contact information back then, like name wrestlers? Uh, name wrestlers in the WWF were very protective, I found. But, like, you know, like Terry Funk wasn't very protective. Like, he let me call him all the time. Like, mm. I feel like if you were in the – like, you know, Devin Storm, I used to talk to a bunch. You know, I think it, when you were on the indie level, you weren't protected. But when you were in the WWF, like, Shawn Michaels wasn't going to go around giving some fans his phone number. Well, not all of them. No. Only the ones who had Somas. I, that's not actually where I was going with that, but – Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going the other way with that. Okay, only the ones he can give Solmas to? Yeah. Speaking of wrestling fans and phone, I, I just want to surprise you with this. Hey, the wrestling fans. It's <laughs> Tuesday, December 29th. You want a wrestling fart seat? This is Dominic. Did you just say fart seat? I- 
Uh, today's wrestler's birthday. Let's see. We got Billy Garrett, who wrestled as Ooh. the medic back in the day. We got ring announcer Justin Roberts. We got B-Boy from Japan, Naomi Susan. We got Tarek the Great, Kiyoshi Nakami. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Okay, I couldn't keep going with no. that. That was also really loud. It was really loud. He called it the wrestling flat seat instead of hot seat. Dominic, wow. I used to, you know, I, Dominic is a friend of mine back in the day, and boy, he really sounds like shit now, I got to say. <laughs> Dominic, in, those- case you li- in case you listen to this, Dominic, hello. Hope all is well with you. Don't begin your, your free hotline with birthdays. Begin with news. End with birthdays because no one wants to sit through all the birthdays of people they don't know. Doesn't Dominic have a web TV? What? He used to. He had one like back in 90s, 98, maybe. He had one for a long time, and he still has like a, he has like a, um, not Outlook, not Hotmail, whatever. It's one of the Microsoft ones still. So I, 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 think I consider it at least possible if they still have the service that he may have one. I can't believe you just ambushed me with a Dominic Valente hotline, and no one, half the people out there are not going to know what that is, well, are the they? Well, the people listen to Between the Sheets, my. Dominic Valente was the first guy in New York, or the second guy, to do a free wrestling hotline. What people would do, the I was involved being with the team. Ben Lagerstrom. Ben Lagerstrom. <laughs> ben Lagerstrom definitely was the first one. And then Dominic. And what Ben would do and Dominic would do is they would get uh, those companies that you could uh, buy voicemail from. And they would, instead of using it as an answering machine, they would use it like you could leave like up to like five minute messages on there. So they would use that as a free hotline to get things out there. And Ben you know, sold stuff too. Ben sold stuff. I I always got along with Ben. I always liked Ben. I know that I've never met anyone who told me they paid him and got what they wanted, but I've never had a problem with Ben. Ben was always cool with me. So I, I just had, wanted to I just wanted to get your reaction to that. Yeah, I can't believe Dominic's still doing it because I was I was on his hotline as a guest regularly, like selling tapes in like 1996. Is there? I I would think there's no one else left. I would hope. No. Uh, well, there was Dominic. There was Ben. There was Mad Al, my friend, who definitely isn't doing it anymore. And then there was Lightning Lou Diamond, who's Frank Idavia. He's dead. Well, he's definitely there, not doing it anymore. Uh, Boss Hog Calhoun popped up with one for a while, but his oh name my was God. his name was Johnny Gimmick, the voice of wrestling. And then there were these two guys, Vinny and Dimitri, who got like really into like anti Semitism against Evan Ginsburg, and Evan Ginsburg had them arrested. Um. I remember Evan Ginsburg talking about that. I didn't know the whole story. Okay. Oh, yeah. They they were cool with everyone at first, and then they just, like, really, like, they started, like, against everyone, just all sorts of racist stuff and anti-Semitic stuff, and they specifically focused on Evan and Mad Al, my buddy Mad Al, uh, great guy. Hopefully one day I can get him to talk to us on the show. He told Evan, he's like, look, Evan, stop complaining about it. Do something about it. Go down to the police station. File a report. And then Evan actually did it, and Evan filed the report, and these guys were arrested for making threats because it wasn't just anti-Semitic comments. They were like threatening to do things to him and everything on a, on a hotline, and they were both arrested, and uh, I forget what they got, but they both got <laughs> – they both made a mistake in their life. That, that's for sure. There was the Staten Island stud who was like this drunk guy who used to have a hotline. There was so many hotlines. Jose Rodriguez had a hotline. So – um. I guess we're and now we're on the modern version of the hotline. I don't know. Yeah, this is the modern version of the free wrestling hotlines that captivated New York. And and and, and Feinstein had one too. Did he really? Yeah. No, I never called that one. Okay. Um so I guess the last thing we wanted to touch on briefly was the uh new Fighting Spirit magazine came out last week. Yeah, great job, Bix. I read the uh the Nick Bockwinkle article. Really, really great job. Thank you. How, you uh you had a lot of Larry Zabisco uh, quotes in there. What was it like dealing with uh, the legend, the living legend? He was fun. He was just like, oh, what do you want to know? I mean, oh, you want some Nick story? Sure. I mean, he he was he was great. I mean, the, it it ve- occasionally veered into some other stuff. Like he took credit for the NWO. Well, who who hasn't at this point? Well, that's true. I mean, he said it was it stemmed from um, that when he came into WCW originally, it was going to be an AWA invasion. That's interesting. Well, which I think there's a little bit of credibility to it because I sort of like – first he mentions the end – being behind the NWO and then later when I – I just like sort of offhand asked him like when you came into WCW and at first you were going to be AW, billed as AWA champion, then you weren't. What was the deal with that? 
And he said that's why. But then Jim Barnett nixed that part because um, he thought that Larry was going to shoot on Sting. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so, yes, that was Larry Zabisco. I mean, he, he was he was a lot of fun. And then, but he basically, we just talked until his phone uh, was about to die from uh, going on low battery. <laughs> oh, man. What, did he have anything to say about Vern? Um, I don't know if I asked really about Vern. Okay. I should. That's a great article that you wrote about Nick Bockwell. I really loved it. I'm glad that Fighting Spirit gave you enough space to really flesh it out because it's like five or six pages. Uh the only questionable thing about the article is some of the pictures associated with it. Some of them were by Pete Letterberg, the great photographer who has a, uh, a collection of photos that even the ones he didn't take. But they're always great. You always know Pete's stuff when you see it. And then there were ones by Dr. Mike Lano, And, I, you know, no disrespect to Mike. I've always gotten along with him even though he's crazy. I'm fairly certain that maybe he didn't take all those photos. What makes you say that? You know, there's just – <laughs> well, let's just say this reputation. Let's just say that. And then, you know, certain things, you know, in wrestling are neon signs. And, you know, you see John Cena. It's a neon sign that he's not being tested. You see a picture of Hulk Hogan posing and you think. Yes, yeah, so he's definitely not being tested on his promos. They're not like, giving – they're not letting him really like uh, cut loose and improvise. And Yeah, that's it. Yeah. What yeah. are you doing, Joseph Maroon? Uh but yeah, I saw there were a couple pictures I, I saw that Mike. I, I don't know. I'm not gonna. I'm not, maybe he did, but I don't know that Hulk Hogan one and that fighting spirit. I question whether Mike took that. But anyway, great work with that Bix, and uh, you know, fighting spirit does a great job every month. And your article was great, and the other really illuminating article for me. And I'm a major Smoky Mountain fan and a friend of Jim Cornette. But the article he wrote about the end of Smoky Mountain wrestling was fascinating. Yeah, I really liked that. And there was some stuff I didn't know just how many cities like he was eyeing at the beginning. Like I didn't realize that it was supposed to be more than just, you know, uh, East Tennessee and all that. Oh, yeah. It was basically Chattanooga up to Crockett. Yeah. And that just he couldn't because everything just was the TV landscape changing. So he couldn't get so it was it was Greenville, um, Asheville, Asheville, Charleston, West Virginia. Chattanooga, Tennessee. And Chattanooga, and I think that was it. Right? Oh, and Roanoke. Yeah. And boy, if he had had any of those towns, like he points out in the article, those were towns that were that could have competed with Knoxville for being the main town of the territory in terms of per capita, like the, the amount of fans they can get in there. Right. He he said he really just needed a like a third like anchor town. Yeah. I guess, you know, let me ask you this, Bix, because he brought up the issues in getting television in the old Crockett towns, t- despite the fact that Sandy Scott had good relationships with the television stations. Mm-hmm. What stations was South Atlantic Pro Wrestling on? Um, South Atlantic Pro Wrestling, though, also lost like a quarter million dollars in six months or whatever ridiculous figure it was. Right. Were they, were they paying for TV in those markets? I'm sure they were. Were they in those markets, I'm saying? Um, I would think they were. They were. I mean, I would think they at least tried. Okay. Well, yeah. what is, that came to a cre- screeching halt. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other interesting thing I found in there, which I would never heard before, and again, I know Jim's going to do a Smoky Mountain book one of these days, which I I can't tell you. I think he said it's the next book. I, I can't wait for that one. Um, but just exactly what Rick Rubin told him about, you know, okay, time's up. I, I, you know, I can't, can't be losing money anymore on this. You know, I'd never heard that end of it before. Rick Rubin, by the way, who along with me and Bix is a young Jewish man from Long Beach, New York. He, he's from Lido, right? Some Lido. Lido is Long Beach. Yeah. Yeah. You could, you could, well, you used to live in Lido, right? I lived in Lido for many years. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, th- I don't think I'd ever heard quite all those details before. I thought the thing at the end where he explains that he went into kind of a depression and, and it was in large part because like he, he was very grateful to Vince for giving him the job on the booking team. But he felt like the job in and of itself and having to move to Connecticut was the like this big sign of his failure. Yeah. 
I mean, look, he he was out drawing WCW in their common towns, you know. So I I th- I don't think there's any way it could have really been much more successful than it was. I mean, there were booking traps he fell into, sure, that caused issues, but. And think, it was also the market. It was at, it was at the worst point for right. domestic wrestling up to that point. Right. Like I'm curious if he starts like two years earlier. Does he have a little more to work with at first? Um, what, you know, whatever. Um, but I don't think there's anything really to be ashamed of with how Smokey Mountain performed over at, no. at the box office. No. And I mean that's and, like – and by the way, that's like a full le- – he, he did this. This was like a full-length article. This was not his usual column. I mean it was in his column space, but it was it was like six pages, right? It was great. Yeah, it was really, really great. And all of his photos from Smoky Mountain that he took himself. You know, it never really clicked for me until seeing these. Just like all of the, you can tell which ones he took because they're the, the exact same style as the photos he took when he was shooting photos in of Memphis. Memphis. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, right. What, were you, what were you saying? Something else? Um, I was, you know, there are th- certain things, you know, you read about like Abdullah the Butcher no showed him. Joe LaDuke wasn't going to be there that weekend. So there were things like that that, that ha- hampered him. I think really that last year, some of the disappointments to me were, you know, I, that Brad Armstrong didn't get over to the level you that he probably would have a few years earlier that you would hope he would have. Um, and which I – is that due to him or is that more because no one remembered the continental Brad Armstrong anymore? That, that was a long time ago. Right. That was he had been, you know, I think a lot of the Smoky Mountain fans watched WCW. Right. They just didn't go to those shows. So they had seen him beaten down for a while. So I, I, I think that, you know, may have had a negative effect. on. I him. mean, he had been a WCW underneath guy for depending on how you count it. I mean, like five years, eight years, if you count Crock Cro- and WCW, even UWF and all that. So, yeah, I mean, the bright spot of 95 is Al Snow. Yes, I mean, that's it's like he, there, he, the weird thing is he did nothing like that any other ever, time in his career ever again or ever before. Yeah, I mean, he was just this nothing guy for like God, he started in 82. He was on ICW, so 81 or 82. And he also on wrestling at the chase a little bit towards the end. Oh, I didn't know that. OK, yeah. Um, And I was watching. I don't think I had. I, I feel like I should have seen must have seen it before, but I wasn't sure if I, I, I was watching the um, Al Snow and Unabom as Rock and Roll Express. Yeah. Promo on YouTube. That's a great one. Yes. I mean, that's, oh, what is it? It wasn't labeled that, though. So I think I was a little surprised. But I mean, that's a good, it just, although the, he's just, he has, he had a knack for sort of, he was believable as being like a smart, he was a smart ass. Like he was not like, like other guys in a way, I almost said Cornet, but like, there are so many guys, like, even though they still drew heat, you could tell when they were trying to be funny. Yeah. And that's not a knock on them because someone like Jim or whoever, you know, or even Heenan, they, they walked the line where they were saying things in a heel context that were, could would be funny to people who didn't care that they were heels. But Al, something about Al Snow carried, like, he was really, like, had a different, like, there was something, like, weirdly sinister about his smart aleckness. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, he was he was great in that, and I mean, I was always so sad that we never got to see that again. I mean, they should have they brought him up he, right away. He became Avatar. Yep. You almost feel like he would have been better off going to WCW because um, because they I wouldn't have he micromanaged been, him. Yeah, they, he would. Yeah, I mean, I think he would have. Maybe he wouldn't gotten promo time at first, but I think he would have been in the mix as one of those Nitro work rate guys. Yeah, and eventually he would have. You know, right. So, but anyway, Bix, I think we're running about the yes, usual. We, I think we right? know we ran longer than that, but oh, not. To, but it's. I don't think this drag at all. Okay, you can cut out Dominic Volante if it does. But anyway, <laughs> Bix, uh, why don't you plug some stuff? Uh, you know what? Uh, we talked a little bit about some of Scott Teal's publications, and I know he's recently did a reissue of Whatever Happened to Gorgeous George. But you have uh, a version of the Fall Guys out there. Tell us about it. Yeah, if anyone wants to get it on Kindle as an ebook on Kindle, and also have it on PayHip, where you can get the Kindle version as well as uh, for other e-readers. Yeah, I just you know kind of took it and got you know prettied it up and formatted it for as an ebook so you can get it through the kindle store on amazon or if you have another ebook reader i have it on PayHip. although you can also get that for kindle too i have both versions if you buy it there and if you buy it through PayHip, i get a little i get more money because amazon has a thing with 
excuse me, where you can do, you know, you can sell public domain books if you're the first one to do it on Kindle, but you don't get as much of a percentage as anything else. So, um, if it's, it's better for me if you buy it through PayHip, but I'm, you know, I'm good either way. I understand if you prefer the convenience of getting it through Kindle. And, um, that's it. If you do buy it through the Kindle store, um, go, you know, go through my Amazon thing, which is tinyurl.com slash Bix Amazon. And, uh, yeah, I mean, for some reason, I was surprised no one else ever had it on Kindle, so I just did it. <laughs> yeah. For those of you who don't know, Fall Guys is the what, – what how would you describe it? Bix, the very first book to break kayfabe? It's kind of like um, – who who it, who was Marcus Griffin kind of a puppet for? Was it Toots Mond? Yeah, I think so. So it's kind of Toots Mond's sort of insider historiography of wrestling would be a good way to put it, I guess. Yeah, that's right. And it's just the first thing of it kind i know you know john lister called it like the observer of the 30s or something like that so, i mean it's it's very interesting it's a look at yes it's the observer of the 30s so pick up a copy and read all about frank gotcha's smatty record <laughs> the leader it's character girl she's not 25 years old any longer <laughs> no only a few only like five people are gonna get that but they're gonna love it <laughs> anyway, Bix. Uh, also, yes, we're at the two more hour mark. So, let's yeah, let's plug fighting, fighting Spirit Magazine that we talked about previously. Check that out. The Bix's article on Nick Bockwinkle is fantastic. Jim Cornette's article about the end of Smoky Mountain Wrestling is another winner. Please go out and check that out. Brian Elliott is the publisher of Fighting Spirit, and he does a fantastic job. And what else do we have, Bix? Anything else? Between the sheets, uh, Bix has won a Sheedy Award for Best Co Host, Chris Zellner won an award for Best Host. Chris Elner's other show, Exile on Bad Street, won Best Show. I believe I was voted Best Guest of All Time. No. Uh, it, it happened. Okay. Um, yes, you were voted Best Guest of All Time. You did not win the Best Guest Award for the year, though. Such bullshit. Um, and and S- Place to Be Nation, uh, PWO, Place to Be Nation, won Best Podcast Network as well. They didn't, they didn't do enough to prop up my guest appearance well that's true that's true but next year next year i should have won something is there a best of show where you can just have my show on my episode on there well i solicited i didn't really get much other than someone asking to put up your uh, fan week story i i said if people give me time stamps i'll do a uh, best of show for the year okay fan week story is the best one so yes it is uh thank you very much thank you i appreciate your support even though i didn't get a sheety award um but, uh, between the sheets uh chris Zellner i'll give you my, i'll give you my she- i'll give you my sheety if liz sends me one <laughs> is, is he actually going to send awards? I don't think so. Okay, I didn't think so either. Um, but anyway, check out that show, everyone. It's my favorite podcast, week in and week out. Always great. This week they uh, covered 1989, December of 1989. Fun, fun stuff. With with check Dylan it. Hales, who did win Best Guest. Son of a bitch. <laughs> you, had to, you had to throw that in my face. Sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Tojo Yamamoto you. Oh, I, 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 I know to go for the eyes. Yeah, I'll, go, I'll hit you with my wooden shoe until you pee made the as yourself. I had to get a reference to pee made the as in on the episode. This is the only episode we haven't talked about him yet. So yes, I had to... every every podcast is going too long this week. Uh, follow Brian on Twitter at Great Brian Last. Follow me on Twitter at David Bix. Um, is it time to say tally ho? It's time. So long, everybody. Tally ho. TV station and I told them for God's sake stop the murder on TV.